Good morning, everyone. I am Montgomery County Council President Gabe Albornoz, and it is an honor and privilege to be with all of you this morning as we go through our county council uh, general business today. Uh, today, we are going to start with a critically important uh, council commemoration, uh, recognizing Black History Month. Black History Month in Montgomery County is a time when we join together to honor the contributions and sacrifices made by our African American community across our nation, state, and here in our community. Black history is American history, and African Americans have shaped the success of our society in every way imaginable. This year, we chose the theme of African American health and wellness, especially in light of the remarkable contributions of our public health leaders across the country and here in our community to address the devastating impacts of COVID-19, particularly on our black and brown community. In our community, we are exceedingly fortunate to have amazing African-American public health leaders, such as Dr. Raymond Kroll, our director of the Department of Health and Human Services, and acting public health officer, Dr. James Bridgers, who both we will hear from after the video. Today is also about recognizing the sacrifices of our community and the way that we have come together to battle this pandemic, not just the pandemic itself, but all the ramifications from it. On behalf of all of my council colleagues and residents across the country, I especially want to thank um, our uh, the, the, my colleagues on the council uh, sitting on the board as the board of health who have worked so hard on behalf of all of our residents to help address the disparities that existed prior to the pandemic and have been exasperated since it. Uh, those disparities, frankly, are immoral, uh, and we are collectively completely committed to ensuring that we address them once and for all. And this year, as council president, uh, one of my major areas of focus is to focus on public health and work with our African American Health Program, all of our public health officials, our community-based organizations, our nonprofit organizations, and our private sector to help make sure we holistically address the needs of our community. Uh, in the video today, you will hear from many of the leaders in our community who have been on the front lines addressing this issue every day. And we can't forget uh, that those public officials have just been under siege. Uh, we were all heartbroken with the messages that we know Dr. Gales received when he was here uh, working on behalf of all of us, and we know that has been extended in many ways to Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Kroll and all of our public health officials, and we stand united in our fights against hate, which we know still exists today. So we stand committed uh, as a community to come back stronger, and we look forward to uh, the commemoration that we are going to have today to recognize and celebrate the sacrifices and the leadership of so many. In our, uh, attended, uh, our, our attendee list today includes, as I said, Dr. Uh, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Kroll. Uh, we also have Ms. Cherie Branson here, Mr. Greg Wims, Ms. Linda Plummer from the NAACP, Ms. Anita Powell and Ms. Denise Jones. Christopher Barclay, our former member of the Board of Education, Mr. Byron Johns, co-chair of the Black and Brown Coalition. My former colleague and friend, Councilmember Valerie Irvin, uh, is in the audience as well. And so is Reverend Kendra uh, Smith from, uh, and we also have Dr. Sandra Mann, Dr. George Benjamin, Dr. Coots, uh, the president and CEO of Holy Cross Hospital. We have Charlene Day, a registered nurse specializing in maternal and uh, child and health and, and labor and delivery. We have the Reverend Matthew Watley. Uh, we have Lillian Holt, uh, Kimantri Rollins, uh, Ms. Jackie Williams, and Ms. Pat Grant from our African American Health Program. And all of the speakers in the audience are, are invited guests of my colleagues and I, but there are many more leaders in our community who we know would, be, would like to be, participate uh, in today's commemoration. We will be hearing from some of those distinguished leaders shortly. Um, but with that, I now want to turn it over to my two colleagues on the council who all of us so enjoy working alongside and so appreciate their leadership in so many different ways. Uh, first, we will hear from my colleague and friend, Councilmember Will Juwando, followed by Councilmember Craig Rice. Councilmember Juwando. 
Thank you. Thank you, Council President, and uh, happy Black History Month uh, to all my colleagues and to everyone gathered here today. Uh, it's great. To, this is a great Zoom. I, I was, I'm normally in speaker view, but I'm in gallery today because I wanted to see all these all these beautiful faces. Uh, it's 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 a great day. Um, you know, this month uh, is a time where we take special uh, time to set aside and to think and to reflect and to honor and to celebrate the achievements, the accomplishments, the struggles, uh, the victories, uh, the setbacks, the whole encompassing life and journey that has been the Black experience uh, here in America. Uh, just over around three years ago, uh, I brought together and my colleagues and I, we, we commemorated 400 years since the first uh, enslaved, documented enslaved Africans arrived on these shores. And we brought together a beautifully diverse group of African immigrant, West Indian, African American, the whole diaspora to commemorate that event and to chart a path forward uh, for uh, greater healing and opportunity and equity that we know we're still on uh, for our Black community. Um, and uh, we didn't know it then, but it would be one of the last times we would all gather before this pandemic hit. Um, and we have a lot to do, and we have done a lot. Uh, so much has come. You heard some of it described by our council president. Um, and so when we have this year's theme of Black health and wellness, uh, it's a, it's a two-sided coin. Um, there's the this, there's this celebratory side, right, of the great medical professionals and achievements that have happened uh, we have Dr. James McCune Smith, the first Black American to receive a medical degree. Uh, Dr. Gene Spurlock, Dr. Charles Drew, Dr. Marilyn Gatson, uh, who lived many years here in Montgomery County uh, and whose groundbreaking research led to a national sickle cell disease screening program for newborns. That happened right here in Montgomery County at one of our one of our African American residents. And Dr. Corbett, who works at NIH and who was one of the young African American women doctors was leading the research team uh, for the COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, we have that story and that celebration. We've been at the forefront of that medical research as African-Americans. The other is the stark reality that was alluded to, that we have massive and unfortunately, in some cases, growing health disparities that continue to plague the Black and the African-American community. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, I drafted a resolution my colleagues unanimously supported declaring racism a public health crisis here in Montgomery County. Last year, 90% of the new HIV infections were of Black women, 90%. Um, we know that Black and Latino residents were getting COVID at higher rates, uh, were dying 10 years younger. Uh, we, I'm proud of the work this council did to push for the data to make sure we can have a focused and targeted approach in COVID. And we know all the social determinants of health uh, have grown in our very wide, uh, not only nationally, but we have issues here in uh, Montgomery County, whether it be infant mortality, ma maternal mortality, and the like. So we have work to do. Uh, the good news is this team assembled, the people we're highlighting today are on the forefront. This council uh, is committed to it, uh, and we're going to make sure that we work together to address all the legacy and history that has led to these disparate statistics for our African-American community. So today we salute the health professionals in our community who have dedicated their lives to narrowing and eliminating those gaps and promoting wellness in our community. Um, and we never forget the sacrifices that all of our black residents have made both here and local nationally uh, to get us where we are today. And we're still on that journey. So happy Black History Month. And I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you to make sure that we continue to make progress. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Joanna, for those powerful words. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, I really want to thank uh, Councilmember Jawando for those powerful words. Uh, it really is true that for far too long, African-American communities have endured the burden of health disparities as evidenced by this current pandemic. And when we look at this year's Black uh, History Month, uh, it highlights the importance of Black health and wellness and is a reminder that we can only be a more prepared and resilient nation when all communities are healthy and strong. And so when we have our black and brown communities, our communities that are more socioeconomically impacted, that continue to have exacerbated rates when it comes to COVID, when it comes to high blood pressure, hypertension, heart disease, all the things, we know that there's so much work, as you heard from Council Member Juwando, 
needs to be done. So when we talk about this year's Black Health and Wellness theme, it's especially timely because our nation continues to struggle with the impacts of COVID-19, but then also the recovery from COVID-19. We have no idea what the long lasting impacts will be of people who've actually contracted the disease. And so it will be incredibly important for us to remain vigilant to understand that those who were affected at a larger rate, those that are in our black and brown communities, those that are socioeconomically impacted, continue to have the resources that are necessary to ensure their healthiness and well-being. So this month really serves as an opportunity to reflect not only on physical, but also on mental and emotional health and how many communities have remained resilient in the face of the healthcare inequities that we see that exist and how cultural and ancestral traditions have informed our understanding of wellness. We need to seize this opportunity that we have before us to where people are more mindful of their physical, mental, and emotional health. We need to make sure that we utilize these opportunities to where people understand how important it is to break those barriers that have kept so many of us from being successful. A child that walks into school who's mentally or physically unhealthy cannot do as well as a counterpart who is. It's very clear. I'm at the National Association of Counties this week, and I'm here talking about social and emotional learning and mental health, especially when it comes to our school children, something in which we need to do more working with the Biden administration, working with everyone from our federal partners to our state partners, the local leaders across this country to make sure that folks understand just how important this is. We can truly build back, as the president says, a better nation. But the only way that we can do it is to acknowledge the failures and the challenges that we've made over the previous years. That's the reason why the council supported Council Member Jawando's lead when it came to declaring racism a public health emergency. That's on all of us. But we can make a difference, and we have. And I want to close by just lifting up our partners in the county. When it comes to our African American health program, when it comes to the NAACP, when it comes to our churches, when it comes to our nonprofit leaders, when it comes to our health leaders in the community, all of you deserve so much praise for what you have done. Standing up programs like the Black Physician Network, standing up programs like diabetes and heart disease management, standing up infant mortality and making sure that those programs are there to reduce those inequities. All of those things are progress that we have made, many that happened before the COVID pandemic. And we thank you for that. And we know that as Council Member Jawando said, there's still more work to be done. And I look forward to working with you in that capacity over my short time here on the council, but hopefully in many other roles as we continue to foster better health for our black community. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Council Member Rice. And as a member of the HHS and Education and Culture Committee and chair of the Education and Culture Committee, I know you've been on the front lines addressing those mental health issues as all of my colleagues have. And I can't thank you both enough. So uh, just a quick run of show. Uh, in, in, in just a moment, uh, we're going to see an incredible video that was produced by our wonderful public information office team. I especially want to thank uh, Public Information Officer Jordan Lindsay and Audio Visual Production Specialist Joseph Thompson for producing today's video segment and everybody that contributed to it. Uh, after the video, we are going to hear from Dr. Kroll and then Dr. Bridgers, and then all of my colleagues will uh, speak as well. And then we are going to hear from several of our distinguished invited guests this afternoon. We will then read the proclamation, my colleagues and I, and we will end uh, with a, a poem, uh, Still I Rise by Maya, Maya Angelou, uh, read by Emily Cumbie, uh, an intern in the office of Vice President Glass, who uh, he will introduce uh, at the very end. So with that, let's uh, see the video. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, oh, turn me around. Throughout the years, the African-American community has evolved and overcome several obstacles. 
During Black History Month, we celebrate all the achievements, highlight excellence, and look forward to the bright future of African Americans, not only nationwide, but also right here in Montgomery County. This year's theme is Black Health and Wellness, and we're going to start by taking you to church. We shall, we shall overcome. We shall. Throughout the history of African Americans, the church has always been a cornerstone of the community. So at one time, it was just the safe haven, and I believe that it still continues to be a safe haven. So if you go all, all the way back to the days of slavery, the church was the one place that African Americans had. That was the one place where you could, you, you know, safely learn how to read, that you could freely express yourself and not be fearful of um, someone telling you that you couldn't do that. Here at Kingdom Fellowship AME Church in Silver Spring, the history runs deep. Our four core values are gather, grow, give, and go, which essentially is we go out into the community and serve everyone. Today, they continue to serve the community, not only religiously, but through various resources, including health. In today's time, it's still a safe haven. It's a place where if you need a sense of security, whether it is food security, whether it is housing, whether it is help with employment, you are fleeing from domestic violence, or whether you just are new to the area and you need someone who understands you, the church is that. We offer a variety, an array of resources. It is extremely, extremely exciting. So we have, since March of 2020, been offering our emergency food distribution. And we've been hosting those food distributions throughout the East County region. We're also serving in some of the hardest hit apartment communities. We also serve at the uh, elementary schools that are in this area. And so we work directly with the principals um, and the staff to facilitate the food distributions that we have there. We're also supporting the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless. We supply their breakfast bags for their homeless men's shelter. We partnered with African American Health Programs, so they've been here on Wednesdays. In addition to that, we've added on vaccines. So we work very closely with Holy Cross Hospital. They are one of our primary medical partners, and we started that over a year ago. Some of the clinics happen here, but again, with the clinics, we go out into the community and trying to make it easier for people to be able to access some of these services. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Montgomery County's data dashboard shows that communities with a high percentage of African Americans have been impacted by health disparities, including lack of accessibility, which has been a troubling pattern in U.S. history. From a historical perspective, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois pointed out the disparities that we've had in the African American community. So this is not new. This is something that has been part of a big legacy of slavery, um, the inequities, the mistreatment. Um, over the years. In general, for the African American community, we always talk about the Tuskegee experiments and things that go back as far as slavery and all of the misinformation and disinformation about African American physiology and health care. There's a healthy distrust of health care in general because we've been marginalized for so long. Well, COVID 19 did, like many new diseases when they entered the community, uh, it impacted the most vulnerable and those with disparities. And of course, that means communities of color and also people who had those underlying diseases of heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, if they got infected, they were much more likely to get a severe case of COVID. And therefore we saw a disproportionate impact on communities of color. So there were so many limitations, you know, throughout our history that really marginalized us in, in, in many cases, despite the best efforts of those who were practicing medicine, we got second class healthcare because we were seen as second class citizens. We continue to not treat everybody equitably in our healthcare system today. Um, some of it is conscious bias, but a lot of it is unconscious bias. And we have a lot of work to do to make sure that people recognize the disparities and the way they think about treating people um, in our system. African Americans are among those often overrepresented in the child welfare and criminal justice systems and experience higher levels of disadvantage on measures of health education and economic development. However, the black community continues to prevail and has come a long way. We need to make sure that we um, do the kinds of things that we can to um, 
prevent illness in the first place. So getting down the ideal body weight is very important. So exercising, even if you just get up and walking. Nutritional and fitness awareness is another solution and can ultimately help the black family structure thrive. Positive health overall is important for the black family structure um, simply because we have some of the highest numbers in terms of uh, chronic disease, um, which is highly preventable. Some of these uh, diseases are adversely created from the choices that we make, whether it's the foods we eat or the foods we shouldn't be eating or some of the elements that we consume heavily, you know, just because they were always around us, you know, alcohol, cigarettes, et cetera, et cetera. So our goal is to help break that curse and help uh, our people make life enhancing uh, decisions. When it comes to nutrition and fitness, we host free events, um, you know, pop-up events. We host an annual Fit Father's Day celebration, downtown Silver Spring, where we see five to 600 families come out and do a group workout. We use the resources of the website. We have healthy recipes on there and simple recipes that dads can make themselves instead of taking their kids to fast food. A lot of our information is based on eating more fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So I feel as though uh, overall health and fitness, you know, changing the mind, how the brain thinks about making decisions, uh, also gives us the willpower to stay on the course to make other positive um, life enhancing decisions. So I think if the black family structure had a little bit more of that um, as the basis, as the foundation, we wouldn't have as many obstacles and hurdles that we face. Black families also need healthy moms and babies. We care for the mind, body, and soul. According to the African American Health Program, a disproportionately high infant mortality rate exists in the African American population. Research has shown that there are disparities between the, the Caucasian population and the African American population in terms of birth outcomes. So our African American babies do poorly in labor, delivery, care. We have more comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, you know, just more stresses in life. That's why the organization's maternal and child health focus area seeks to improve the likelihood of good pregnancy outcomes among black women in Montgomery County. What we do as a registered nurse, case manager, we call the clients and we eliminate or try our best to eliminate any stresses that they may have. If they have issues with paying their rent, we try to assist them with that. If they have relationship issues, if they have medical problems, if they go to the physician and their physician uses terminology that they're not familiar with, or sometimes they may feel intimidated by the physician, they'll come to us, we'll explain to them what their diagnosis is. We educate them on proper nutrition, the importance of exercise, the importance of taking their medications as ordered by the provider. Our program stresses the importance of education, which we use as prevention prevention from becoming preeclamptic, from becoming hypertensive, from becoming diabetic. So the purpose of our program is prevention, prevention first. And how can some of these health disparities within the black community be addressed? Leadership and representation of African-Americans in healthcare can help lead to a possible solution. Especially in a diverse community like Montgomery County, people need to see themselves in leadership in order really to even trust health care. So I think it's very important to see representation, whether it's it's uh, minorities in nursing, minorities as physicians, um, even the front desk staff that welcomes people into the hospital. The more people see themselves, the more comfortable they are with health care. And county leaders are also already working towards a solution, which includes the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act which was spearheaded by council member Nancy Navarro and enacted by the full council in 2019. And this passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. The legislation was brought forth to serve as an instrument to begin dismantling persistent disparities seen throughout history. This is an instrument that we can use to, to, to equip us to better address these issues, both legislatively and through 
uh, budgetary decisions and through initiatives, etc. It is groundbreaking, uh, and so that would apply for all of our folks who we know continue to be uh, challenged with health disparities and make sure that social justice does have that in definition. We're taking this step forward uh, in making more of a reality that everyone here in our county, regardless of who they are, can get one step closer to realizing the promise of Montgomery County. United we win, working and building towards a brighter future. Well, that was outstanding uh, and extraordinarily well done. Thank you all so much. Uh, we will now hear from two of those extraordinary African-American leaders in our community. Uh, and then we will hear from my colleagues and I'll go over the order colleagues uh, right after we hear from our next two speakers. But next we will hear from Dr. Raymond Kroll, our director of the Department of Health and Human Services, followed by Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Kroll. Good morning, Council President Albernoz, and thank you to Council and for all the guests that are here today. Uh, honored to be here in, in, in this in this this morning and in the company of of uh, s such wonderful people who have made uh, and continue to make racial equity and social justice a priority in, in Montgomery County. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply proud of, of the work that the county has done and, and, and the company that we're in today. You know, diabetes, infant mortality, maternal health, high blood pressure, heart disease, jobs, housing, educational opportunities are all places where the black community, where the disparities show up for the black community. And it is, and it is historically the case and it remains the case even in as, as forward looking a, a community as Montgomery County. Um, depression and suicide, limited access to health care, uh, and the decisions that are made within the healthcare system reflect and continue to reflect on, on uh, and are driven by issues of bias and implicit bias that have been historic and, and, and are indeed endemic to, to, to the state of America in many cases. Um, and of course, COVID-19 uh, came along and, and, and made it abundantly clear, made those disparities abundantly clear for us. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, a year ago when George Floyd died, uh, I got a new understanding of the phrase that some of my younger clients have used, um, feeling some kind of way, uh, was their expression. And, and, uh, I was feeling some kind of way about, about, about where we were in America and where I was as a black man in America, angry and frustrated and sad and hurt and, and, and determined, um, uh, at the same time. But, but, but at this, and, and, and driven to try to do more to try to resolve some of these longstanding issues. But at the same time, and over that year, I watched uh, council and I watched the county executive and I watched the community and I became proud. When I look at Fit Fathers, prouder, I became a fit father, the work of Fit Fathers, the work of the African American Health Program, the, the Black Physicians Health Network, um, the, the equity programs that we put forward in testing and vaccinations efforts and our efforts to, to make sure that people had what they needed and it was getting to the people who could who could get there, who, who couldn't get there easily. That work made me proud. Um, our way forward is, is long. Um, we have a long road to go to recover from COVID and we have a long way to go to continue to drive the, 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 the address the issues of, of equity. Um, in, in health and, and in wellness of, of the black community. Um, there's a lot of hard work ahead and there is no crystal stair. Um, this is going to be a long and continuous hard slog and we have to remain ever vigilant lest we slide back into some old and destructive ways. Um, in this moment, it is, it is fitting to and uplifting for me and, and I hope for, the, for, for those who are watching that we take a moment to look back at how far we have come as a society and as a community and to, to, to say thank you uh, to those on whose shoulders we stand to gather our strength and, and our resolve to, to, to continue to move forward. So I'm happy to be here this morning and, and, and want to thank the council for, for, for recognizing and, and for this, 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 this moment in history for us. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Dr. Kroll. So beautiful, so powerful. Uh, Dr. Bridgers. 
Good morning, Council President Albernos, Council Vice President Glass, Director Kroll, who echoed many of the uh, my recurrent remarks that you will hear. Uh, council members and to all those present today for this Black History Month commemoration. Also, thank you for all of the esteemed members joining the Black History Month commemoration and proclamation um, for keeping me in touch with the pulse of the community. I have ongoing conversations with uh, many of you, and if you don't know, then you need to ask, and it's okay to ask. I've learned that. Um, many have indicated, and that was such a powerful presentation that it actually brought tears to my eyes because I can reflect some of those um, uh, disparities in healthcare uh, uh, needs in my own personal quest uh, for my own wellness. Uh, however, black health and wellness and healthcare disparities are not a new reality. They've been documented for decades and reflect longstanding structural and systemic inequities. One of the programs, as we saw uh, illustrated and, 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 and highlighted in the um, video is our uh, uh, health um, uh, African-American uh, health program that sits under uh, the Health and Human Services umbrella in the Office of Community Affairs. It has been instrumental as one of our community health partners and continue to provide services that include outreach, health education, support groups, and as again illustrated nurse case management. But I also want to highlight one of the chronic illnesses that is at the forefront of our uh, health equity framework and our community health needs assessment. It's also important to mentioned the growing cancer disparities uh, with Blacks in Montgomery County. Blacks in Montgomery County continue to experience a disproportionate burden of cancer incident and mortality. For this reason, public health service continues to operate and strengthen its capacity uh, to serve those who have uh, low income and uninsured uh, uh, needs. It is also imperative that we continue to work collaboratively to eliminate racial health disparities and access to quality health care. I reemphasize access to quality health care, health education, access to care, multi-level and intergenerational communication will help us improve health disparities and lead to better health outcome. As many have, have, have uh, mentioned, as the pandemic in, enters into its third year, and who would imagine that we will be entering into our third year on March the 3rd, I believe. This focus, uh, this year's focus on health and, and wellness provides an opportunity to honor our past, celebrate our accomplishments, and press forward for progress. Press forward for progress. Today, we celebrate Black History Month together and we all collectively and collaboratively look forward to a healthier tomorrow in all of our communities. Thank you, Council uh, uh, President Albernos, for allowing me to bring brief remarks this morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Crow. We appreciate your leadership and that of your entire team. Uh, next, we will hear from my colleagues. Colleagues, we're going to start with Councilmember Navarro, and then we're going to have Council Vice President Glass, followed by Councilmember Katz. Then we will hear from Councilmember Reamer, then Councilmember Hucker, and then Councilmember Friedson. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you so much, Mr. President. It is such an honor to be with all of you today. Uh, this is a very important celebration every single year. I'm so inspired and just really, you know, fired up to continue the hard work because it is truly a community. And this is what is the best thing about Montgomery County. This is why I chose to move to Montgomery County 31 years ago when my husband and I were going to have our first daughter precisely because of the extraordinary resilience, the example, and the sense of community that exists here in our county. And it's only gotten better. And so I, I just want to use my brief time to just do some shout outs here because it's so important. Dr. Gales, um, what an extraordinary leader in a very difficult time. Dr. Kroll, who I know when he decided to take uh, this position had no idea he would be thrown into this chaotic situation to make sense of such a crisis and uh, that sense of responsibility he just took on, you know, head on and just led us as well. Dr. Bridgers, 
who has continued um, to guide us with his calm demeanor uh, and really truly let, has been leading us through this, you know, roller coaster where we think that we're done and then we get thrown back into the thick of it. He has been there to lead us and give us great, um, you know, advice every step of the way. So I want to say thank you. I want to thank our community partners and in particular people like Pat Grant and Byron Johns because, again, none of us has had a manual to deal with this pandemic. And then the most egregious part of the pandemic and the part that I know I was so worried about from the very beginning was that we all knew that the disparities would be exacerbated and we knew where exactly our communities that were going to be most impacted recited. And, and it was just extraordinary um, to get together over literally a weekend, Council Member, Council President Albernos and I, and we just had this aha moment that, you know, we're going to have to be targeted and we are going to have to put forth these targeted COVID-19 health initiatives. You know, so we decided to come together and we just had to summon everyone who has been working in this space. And within like four days, they turn around these proposals for the Latino focused health, uh, COVID-19 health initiative and the African-American program came to target the one for the black community. And we turned to the executive and said, please fund this. And he did, and here we are. Um, so I want to thank those leaders because not only was it in the health space, but in the, in the education space, the equity hubs, what an extraordinary model that now we have as a template to continue on as the best practice. As it was stated in the video, our faith-based communities and just everyone, everyone who literally just gave from their hearts such generosity has been extraordinarily inspiring. I want to thank my colleagues, council members, Rice and Jawando, because they have, again, continued to not just represent all their constituents, but they understand that as people of color in these selected positions, we all have a responsibility to also highlight the very unique needs of our communities because that's what equity actually is. And I know because I've, I've had you know, personal experience with this that a lot of times people wanna criticize you and say you only, you, know, you only care about this community and you only care about that community. Well, we are indeed multidimensional beings. We are capable of representing all of our constituents, but we also have a duty to speak truth to power and point out that there are disparities that require additional resources and targeted interventions. And so I want to salute them because they have done this with, with grace. And I know with Councilmember Rice being term limited, he leaves a legacy that was started by people like Councilmember Valerie Irvin, who was the first <clears throat> black woman elected to the Montgomery County Council. These are important leaders that we have to make sure open the path in the way for others to walk through. Finally, I will say that, you know, as a wife of a black man and the mother of two Afro-Latina powerhouses, this has not been an easy time for the black community. It has never been an easy time, but I think that when you layer all of these particular really life-defining events, like the last presidential administration, like the George Floyd murder, like the pandemic that has disproportionately affected the black community, especially when it comes to death rates. It has been mentioned before, the mental health is gonna be super important. And so in my household, we have a lot of conversations about, you know, what should we expect now? It feels like the world has absolutely changed, perhaps permanently in so many ways. And so I hope that we continue this sense of collaboration, this sense of generosity, and also this sense of grace with each other to actually usher in a much better future. That this combination of factors that have been so difficult actually allows us to think of more opportunities, better opportunities for our young people and for our children. That is hopefully what we can do and again, I salute all of you because so many of you have just paved that way from years and years and years. Some of us now are about to pass the baton and it is, I think, exciting to see what is possible because of your willingness to step up time and time again. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Councilman Navarro. Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, I just want to say thank you for your love and your dedication to our community. Uh, whether whether you are working in the faith community, the business community, government, or, or the nonprofit sector, uh, we are one community. And while our community might not be perfect, it is because of your work and your compassion that we'll get there. And I'm hopeful and I'm confident of that, that together we can do that. Um, and whether it is creating greater economic opportunities to ensuring housing fairness, to transportation equity, you know, this is the work that we all have committed to doing here in our own community, here in Montgomery County, because quite frankly, there is no other option. And we have to do right by all of our residents, especially those who haven't been treated right historically. And Black History Month should be a time not only to honor and celebrate the history of our African-American elders and predecessors, but, but I think more importantly, it should be a time for us to recommit ourselves to the important work that we need to do here at home. And I look forward to continuing to do that work with each and every one of you, and I appreciate you for your longstanding dedication to doing that work and to holding our hands as we continue moving forward to making progress that is fair and right for all of our residents. So thank you very much for being here this morning. Mr. President, I yield back. Thank you so much. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I too am very honored to be here and see so many friends, some of whom have been lifelong friends on this call, some of whom are newer friends. And um, it brings back such memories. And, and you, anyone that's ever heard me speak uh, has, knows that I enjoy the history. And I enjoy the history of Montgomery County. And, and, and many people on this call have, have given me uh, history lessons on things I didn't know about Montgomery County. And, and I'm most appreciative of that. But it is so very important to talk about the health as part of history because that in itself uh, is a great reminder of how the inequities have truly been horrible to people in Montgomery County and, and beyond. Uh, it, it, it's truly uh, gratifying to to uh, be reminded. Um, the doctor earlier mentioned about conscious bias and unconscious bias. And, and the unconscious bias is what's been, uh, I guess, haunting, if that's a the fair term for me uh, all along. I, I'm someone that truly believed that my conscious bias, uh, you know, I, I was always someone that was, was aware of my conscious bias, but the unconscious bias during all of our training has truly brought a different, a different message to me. And, and I appreciated uh, the talking about the mind, body, and soul. And that's what we all need to do. And, and I, and I was reminded, and, and uh, Councilmember Navarro uh, certainly was the, 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 the great driving force about the racial equity and social justice uh, legislation that we had that we're all very, so very proud of. And I remember, and in fact, I saw the video just a long, not too long ago. Someone had, had run across it and sent it to me. That, that, uh, that it was the day it was signed, the day that I became the council president. And, and I remember jokingly, and of course, everybody had worked on it for so long, especially Councilmember Navarro and all of my colleagues. But I remember joking and saying, this is the first day can you of my council presidency. Can you imagine what day two is going to be like? And everybody chuckled, thank goodness. And, and you know, everybody uh, said that they had my back. And, and it was, it was, but I have to tell you, right after that, and thank goodness everybody had my back, because right after that, is when the pandemic started to hit. And we all needed to come together in a very different way, including racial uh, uh, equity and social justice, but we all needed to come together in a very different way that we had never, ever planned to win. And why would you? I mean, a pandemic every 100 years and it had to hit my, my, uh, my time, air time. You know, I, I could go on and on, and I'm not, Mr. President. I know that this is a long day for all of us. But I think it is so very important to remember, and, and many of my colleagues and others have heard me say that I believe the community is a family. And it's so very important to remember that a community standing together 
is strong. But when all communities stand together, that's when we're our strongest. So thank you, and, and united, we win. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield back. Thank you so much. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. It's so nice to be joined by such an illustrious group today. It's really an honor, and I want to thank uh, everyone for taking the time uh, to be here with us. It's an exciting day. Black history is American history. I think that's really the, the essential truth. And there is nothing in this country that we see today that isn't the result of that history. And it doesn't matter where you live in America. Everything you see around you is somehow influenced by our history and particularly the history of race and of the struggle for freedom in, of Black people in this country. And that is why we can't tackle the problems that we have today without confronting our past. And we have to understand that past truly and stop hiding it and confronting it. Um, and what we're seeing now today is very troubling. We have a lot of states and localities that are actually passing laws that are intended to prohibit or intimidate teachers from educating students about the history of race in our country. Uh, it is, you know, very, very concerning. But in places like Montgomery County, we can lead. In Maryland, we can lead. We're the home of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tublin, and here in Montgomery County, the home of Josiah Henson. And we are a community with a rich history of Black resistance and freedom, despite slavery and racial oppression. And so while we celebrate that history today, the history of Black people in our community and Black communities here in Montgomery County, we know that this work, it's our job every day and every week and every month, and there is no stopping and there is no resting. So thank you for all of our community leaders uh, for working together and helping us find opportunities to make a difference. I'm, I'm really glad to be with you here today. Back to you, Mr. Council President. Thank you so much, Councilmember Reamer. Councilmember Hucker. Uh, good. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. What what an all star lineup we have uh, this morning! It's it's uh, it's a good morning and shows the talent we have in Montgomery County. Very few counties could assemble a lineup like this. Um, an honor to be here uh, with all of you, especially my predecessors and my seat council members, uh, Irvin and Branson, whose advice I'm always grateful for. Um, you all know well the um, at the Medical Committee for Human Rights. It was 54 years ago. Martin Luther King said, "Of all the forms of equality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane." And, it's so disappointing that injustice is still so stark and here and across the country 54 years later, and we're still challenged to address it. Um, we're obviously uh, not done, nowhere near done, but I don't want to miss the chance to say um, what others have said, that I'm so proud of what the, this council has done working with the administration and our community partners over the last 18 months to address the racial equity gaps that we saw first in testing and, and then in vaccinations. And I'm very grateful uh, to the NAACP branch and Ms. Plummer and, and Branson for recognizing uh, our focus on that. Um, as Councilmember Navarro said, none of us had a manual uh, to get through the last two years, but I'm very thankful that um, we know a lot more now than we did then. And I'm proud of um, what um, Councilmember Navarro called out about our efforts as the council to address those equity gaps and her leadership and Council President Albernaz and Council Members Rice and Jawando as well. And all of our colleagues and partners, it was really a team effort to address um, address those those disparities that we had. We we absolutely have a duty to speak truth to power. That's very true. And we can't be satisfied with the progress we've made. It takes it took years to create the systematic inequality in our healthcare system. It's going to take a long time to dismantle it. Um, and we all know how much work we have to do, but we shouldn't uh, miss the chance to, to celebrate um, milestones uh, like what we've, what we've seen and what we're talking about today. So again, it's a pleasure serving on a council so focused on this um, and uh, addressing wellness and, and working alongside all of our great community partners. And I really look forward to continuing to work with you um, on this uh, in the future because we're, we're nowhere near done, as you all know. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Councilmember Hucker. Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. I am so humbled to be part of this commemoration and to join such an incredible and illustrious group of community leaders and uh, to talk about these important issues and uh, 
much of uh, my thoughts have been said, but I just wanted to uh, note uh, Frederick Douglass, great Marylander, who has been noted a couple times here, said we have to do with our past only as we can make it useful for the present and the future. And I really do think that that is what today is all about. That is what this conversation is about. When we talk about uh, these uh, issues, you know, black history is, is Maryland history and, and American history, as has been uh, noted, but everything that we talk about today is, is you know, both part of, uh, you know, history from a collective standpoint and from an individual standpoint. Uh, we were talking earlier about the discrepancies when it comes to COVID, uh, when it comes to HIV, when it comes to cancer, when it comes to so many uh, health uh, disparities, uh, and, and, and never more true, and, and Council Member Jawando noted this, uh, when it comes to pregnancy-related uh, issues. Uh, you know, Two-thirds of pregnancy-related issues and pregnancy-related deaths are preventable, and that is disproportionately felt and impacted by the black community. Black pregnant people are three times more likely to birth children with low birth weight. The numbers are staggering, and so when we talk about the issues that face our community and that face the black community that collectively are rooted from uh, before any of us were here, individual issues related to health uh, and wellness begin before children are born. And uh, that is uh, what makes this work uh, so important and so challenging. It's not a choice that anybody is making uh, to be born uh, with the challenges uh, that they face. And so it's up to us as a community and as a society uh, to stand up and, and, and to be as intentional uh, in dismantling those challenges uh, as those structures were intentional uh, in being created uh, as uh, as barriers of, of oppression. When uh, we talk about black history in Montgomery County and in Maryland and in the United States of America, uh, we have the triumphs and, and there are so many people on this uh, on this commemoration who represent those triumphs. Uh, we also have the tragedies and we have to confront both and we have to recognize both and we have to commemorate both. Uh, and we also have the racial terrorism that still plagues uh, our, our community as well. And we have to confront it and we have to uh, live up to uh, the challenges uh, that it requires in order to reverse uh, the issues uh, that we face as a community, because unless everybody in our community is able to reach their full potential, then no one in our community uh, and our community as a whole cannot reach uh, its full potential. So thank you for all of the work uh, that you have done in, in our community. Thank you uh, for, for being part of this uh, commemoration. And certainly we have a lot more work uh, to do to, to make this history useful. Uh, for the present uh, and for the future uh, in Montgomery County and beyond. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you so much to all of my colleagues. Those were incredible comments from all of you. We are now going to hear from some community leaders uh, that are in the audience today. Uh, first, we will hear from Ms. Cherie Branson, uh, our former colleague on the County Council and my former colleague in the previous Leggett administration. We will then hear from Ms. Uh, Anita Neal Powell, uh, then Ms. Denise Jones, then we will hear from Reverend Kendra Smith. And finally, we'll, we will hear from Ms. Jacqueline Williams on behalf of our African-American Health Program. Ms. Branson, I turn it over to you to make some comments. Thank you so much. Um, she said, my name is Cherie Branson. I am here on behalf of the Montgomery County NAACP. I wanna thank you all for inviting the NAACP to this uh, lovely program on, on Black history. Um, I first need to acknowledge the long-standing work of the African-American Health Program. You know, they have been truly uh, uh, laborers in the field. Um, and, you know, as they say, the, the work, their work is much, but, but the laborers are few. They have been working literally for decades. And, and so I, I wanna acknowledge them and, and make sure they get all the recognition and money that they should get. Um, I want to also, you know, let me, I, I, I want to quote uh, Lao Tse, um, who said, you know, few, everyone knows that water can run through rocks, but few people act accordingly. And when it comes to the situation we face with health disparities, everyone knows it, but few people act accordingly. I have, um, we, we, 
we all understand the social and economic determinants of health-related disparities. We all understand hypertension and diabetes and stroke and maternal mortality have underlying conditions that are both social as well as physical. The social has everything to do with the stress that is caused by being Black in America. If we don't acknowledge that, then we're never going to get past this. The absolute need to cope with the stress of racism is what leads to much of the harm in our mental and physical well-being. If we don't acknowledge this water, we'll never get, we'll never figure out how to build this dam. I want to close out <laughs> by quoting Councilman Andrew Friesen, who said something I thought was absolutely brilliant. He said, we have to be as intentional in knocking down these barriers as the people were who created these barriers. So I really want to thank the members of this council for your intention, your work, the way you have genuinely put money to meet problems. But I want to ask you to be more intentional too, because the problems haven't gone away. It is about the way we live every day. Um, so I should probably stop there before I get in more trouble. And so for um, so for the Montgomery County NAACP, once again, I thank you for including us. Thank you for your pointed remarks. Uh, Ms. Anita Neal Powell. Good morning, Council President Gabe Avanaz, Vice Council President Evan Glass, members of the Montgomery County Council and special guests who are here today to be included in the annual Black History Month program, Black Health and Wellness as this year's honorees. On behalf of the Lincoln Park Historical Foundation and the Leroy E. Neal African American Research Center, I congratulate the council for spearheading this annual program since 2015, starting with former President George Leventhal, who recognized Black people and communities across the county. I also congratulate today's honorees who have been very active in the community and in the county and are deserving of this recognition. The theme of Black health and wellness is a more fitting for this occasion, especially since we are still going through the mass undertaking of staying healthy, washing hands, staying in your lane, and not getting close to each other in public spaces and wearing your mask because we want to stay healthy and keep others safe. Thank you, honorees, for doing what you are doing through community outreach, webinars, training, and partnering with faith-based organization and the African American Health Program to give free COVID tests, booster shots, and vaccinations to distribute food and offer programs to keep us physically and mentally fit and more. We are really grateful to each of you and to the Montgomery County Council for its recognition of you and your community services. Finally, Black history is superpower and you are doing your part in keeping us safe and informed. President Avernars, thank you for inviting me to share a few remarks of congratulations to our honorees this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Ms. Denise Jones. Good morning. I want to thank the council and in particular council member Evan Glass for the invitation to join you for this celebration of Black History Month in Montgomery County. The um, focus of black health and wellness is timely in this time of social movement of racial equity and social justice in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the health disparities are in stark relief. I'm not a healthcare professional but my work as a small business owner of Brasser & Company in Montgomery County is in uplifting social emotional wellness through my work as a teaching artist and arts administrator to bring arts and STEAM programs in a variety of disciplines to support Montgomery County residents of all ages. My Healthy Families, Healthy Communities project 
delivered with my organizational partner, Carpe Diem Arts, is specifically designed to help serve our residents to break down racial barriers, break down unconscious bias, and to support the development of individual agency to create a healthier society and community for all. The Healthy Families, Healthy Communities program served through parents workshops, adult art engagement, early child learning through movement and music, the social emotional wellness of adolescent girls, healthy cooking classes to nourish our bodies and minds, dance for fun and fitness, bringing a variety of cultural dances, and a community art project, and of course, music for a shared memorable experience that nurtures our spirit. The arts can be a wide welcoming bridge to serve the individual and offering space for creative solutions together. When we know one another, we work better together. I'd also like to take this moment to thank council members Glass and Rice for their advocacy in the council, providing more money for the arts last year when we so badly needed arts interventions. And again, the council is to be acknowledged for the additional monies provided for increased service to seniors. The arts heal, and I'm happy to be working in collaborative Montgomery County to serve our, your constituents and my neighbors everywhere. Thank you. Thank you, so beautifully said. And uh, now next we'll hear from Reverend Kendra Smith. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, on, on behalf of our pastor, Senior Pastor Reverend Matthew L. Watley. Um, we are so, so delighted. Uh, to be here today, and thank you so very much um, for um, allowing us to be a part of this wonderful celebration. Um, as was already shared, um, just the role of the African American church in our communities is critical. Um, and we have, um, as a collective, been ex just involved in every aspect of um, life as it relates to the Black community. And um, it is a privilege, it is an honor, it is indeed our honor to serve. Um, it is our pleasure to serve, and we are glad to be a small representation of all of the other churches and faith-based organizations that are working collectively in Montgomery County to respond to the needs. We are one church, but there are many other churches, as you all very well know, and faith-based organizations that are serving and continue to serve. Uh, we have been able to do this through partnership, and so we are excited about the collaborative partnerships that we have with many of you that are already here, uh, the African-American Health Program, Holy Cross Health. That is how we have been able to continue to serve since March 2020, the beginning of this pandemic. Um, and we're committed uh, to serve. We are um, consistently concerned um, about the holistic health issues of our people, um, and we will continue to do whatever is necessary to ensure that we stay on the front lines to work collaboratively with you and all in order to respond uh, to these issues and to help our people and all people to live a full, abundant, and strong and better life. Thank you again so very much for the opportunity to be a part of this wonderful and beautiful celebration, and we look forward to our continued partnership together. Thanks so much. Thank you, Reverend Smith. I think it's especially appropriate to say amen. <laughs> um, absolutely. Uh, last uh, among our speakers in this distinguished audience, we're going to hear from Ms. Jacqueline Williams speaking on behalf of our African American Health Program. I'm so glad Ms. Branson, especially in her comments, uplifted the work of the African American Health Program. I can speak in the first person uh, about the their remarkable work in the community, especially these last two years. And for generations, uh, they have been leading the way in so many ways. So, Ms. Smith, uh, Ms. Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I want to thank uh, you for the opportunity, um, Councilman Alvarez and Vice President Glass, uh, to give us uh, a chance to talk about the, um, you know, to uh, celebrate the Black History Month. Um, Pat Grant and I will be attacking today. <laughs> Um, throughout history, the Black population has been a resilient people in the face of adversity. COVID highlighted the serious gaps in health care nationally, statewide, and locally within Montgomery County. During the worst of the pandemic, the Black population had high numbers of deaths and cases, in part due to underlying health conditions, which caused premature death. Though our health care system is fractured, the African-American Health Program will be there to help mend the gaps 
in health care in order to forge better health outcomes for the Black population in Montgomery County. We, as Black people, stand on the shoulders of those who fought for our liberty, our rights, and our future. This includes our stalwart religious leaders, as you've heard, our steadfast community activists, thank you, Cherie, our resilient family, and our emerging youth movement, who are our future. The future is now. Thank you again, council members, for the recognition of Black History Month. Much appreciation. Pat? Uh, I, I didn't know my mic was on, I'm sorry. Uh, council member, uh, Council President Abinaz, Vice President Glass, and all of the council members uh, assembled here today. Last night, I read an article that said, while slavery may have ended for some in 1865, racism did not. This brought to mind the resolutions that were passed by the council. Um, one, racism is a public health crisis and the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act. And I commend each of you for passing that, those resolutions. As we look at Black history, we need to determine how we end the issues around disparities and equities and uh, inequalities in our health and healthcare systems. I read another article and I saw a picture of a man holding up a sign that gave me some pause and hope. And uh, this was, uh, in my mind, the beginning of a prevention strategy. The sign said, racism is a virus and we are the vaccine. Just like we have come together to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, we can solve this greater pandemic of racism together. I wanna say sorry to council member Jawando for what happened to you. Thank you, President Arbanaz and um, all of the county council members. Uh, I want to th throw a shout out, if I can, <laughs> to the two who uh, helped us through the testing, who are our co-sponsors for uh, getting the COVID-19 project off of the ground. And it's Council Members Rice and Council Member Jawando. And, uh, but I want to thank the council for what you do each and every day. And for this Black History Month celebration, it is really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you uh, and all of the speakers. We're now going to uh, read the proclamation colleagues. So please pull it up. Uh, we're gonna tag team this and then we're gonna end with the beautiful poetry reading. Um, so let's, uh, I'll give every, uh, all of my colleagues a moment just to bring up the proclamation. And of course, this is a proclamation of the Montgomery County Council. Uh, whereas February is Black History Month, which recognizes and honors the history and contributions that African Americans have made to this country. And whereas in 1926, Black educator and historian Carter G. Woodson moved to officially recognize the achievements and contributions of African Americans to our nation's history and identity. And Whereas Black history is complicated and unlike any other story ever told, enslaved Africans were brought to this country under brutal conditions, and those who survived birthed generations of people who became physicians, educators, scientists, and world changers, and... Whereas Maryland is home to African-American heroes like Fre Frederick Douglass, Josiah Henson, Harriet Tubman, and Thurgood Marshall, who paved the way for young activists of today who continue to fight for racial equity, freedom, and social justice. And whereas despite the many contributions they have made and continue to make to this country, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that African Americans are more likely to die earlier of all causes as young African Americans are living with diseases that are typically more common at older ages for other races and Whereas racial disparities in health coverage, chronic health conditions, mental health, and mortality persist in this country. These disparities are a result of decades of systemic inequality in American economic, housing, and healthcare systems 
and where as African American medical pioneers in the United States shattered stereotypes, broke barriers, and went on to conduct research, discover treatments, and provide leadership that improved the health of millions of people of all races in this country. And whereas African American medical pioneers in the United States shattered stereotypes, broke barriers, and went on to conduct research, discover treatments, and provide leadership that includes the health of billions of people of all races in this country. And whereas throughout the month of February and all year, Montgomery County will continue to celebrate Black History Month and the African Americans who contributed significantly to the growth and development of our county and our nation through distinguished leadership in the field of health. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby proclaims February as Black History Month, presented on this 15th day of February, signed by myself and Council Members Rice and Jawando. Thank you all so much. Council Vice President Glass will now introduce our final speaker. Well, thank you, everybody. It has been a beautiful morning. Uh, a show of our commitment to our community and the work that needs to move forward. And as we look toward that future, that bright future, I am really excited to introduce Emily Comby, who is a student at the University of Maryland studying public policy, where she is a Banneker Key Scholar. Uh, Emily is also an intern in my office. And she is also a lifelong lover of poetry. She's actually a slam poet and strongly believes in using the arts and specifically poetry as a vehicle for social justice. And while she is in my office, she communicates with all the residents of Montgomery County. And I am excited for her to share her talents right now with you by reading a poem from Maya Angelou that will help inspire all of us as we work together to make our community even stronger, more fair, and more equitable. And Emily, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Council Member Vice President Glass. Good morning, everybody. Happy Black History Month. Um, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to perform. Maya Angelou is one of my favorite poets. So without further ado, this is Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history. You may trod on me in the very dirt, but still like dust all right. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I rise. Did you want me to be broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise up from a past that is rooted in pain. I rise on a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide, leaving behind nights of terror and fear. I rise into a daybreak that is wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. Okay, that was incredible. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, this has been spectacular. I know we went over, but we needed to, uh, given everything that we've all been through. So thank you all so, so, so much. Um, this is especially poignant uh, and such an important time for us to continue to come together as a community to reflect on our past and move forward together. Thank you all so much for joining us.
We are going to move on to the next item uh, on the agenda this morning. And I know colleagues, you're looking at your watches as I am too, but we're going to be okay. Uh, I believe our public health briefing today will not be as long, thank God, uh, as it normally is because the news is much better than it has been. Um, but the next proclamation is recognizing somebody who I had the uh, opportunity to serve with for 12 years in the previous administration. And that is Ms. Linda Herman. And we are recognizing her years of service as executive director of the Montgomery County Employee Retirement Plan. And um, we're going to, uh, I'm gonna be joined by my colleague and friend and chair of our government operations and fiscal policy committee, Nancy Navarro on this one. Uh, and we're gonna limit it to just the two of us so that we can get through uh, the rest of our presentations this morning, uh, cause there is so much to get to and I know uh, that she will speak so diligently on behalf of her colleagues on the committee. But uh, Linda, I wanna personally thank you for your public service. Uh, you have maintained, uh, and I, I wanna make sure I get this number right, um, a, a, a portfolio with assets of more than 8 billion uh, over the course of your career. And uh, the investments that you've made, the way that you have stewarded us through some pretty challenging times as a community, uh, and the way that you have your steadfast leadership and advice and guidance uh, is really so important uh, to honor and recognize the sacrifices of all of our people who decide to serve and work for our county government to serve our public in the way that they do. So thank you so much, Linda. I'm gonna turn it over to the chair of our government operations and fiscal policy committee, Councilmember Navarro, and then we'll read the proclamation for you. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee has worked closely with Ms. Her Herman on every aspect of the county's retirement plans. And we are proud of what we have all accomplished together, going back to the extremely hard years of the Great Recession. We know that the trust's top tier investment performance has meant that less support from county funds has been needed. This has greatly benefited our taxpayers. The outstanding investment performance speaks for itself, but Linda has also joined with us in being among the leaders and focusing on environment, social, and government governance issues, also known as ESG. Our retirement plans are complex and have many moving parts, and the GEO committee has always enjoyed working with Linda to address them. Her expertise and her ability to understand the concerns of all parties have been a great asset uh, her advice and her steadfast leadership has served Montgomery County very, very well. So I know that when I heard that, you know, Linda was, was retiring, uh, I was just like, what? <laughs> no, it is hard because we get used to counting on the expertise and the incredible uh, talent of employees like Linda. But in this particular instance, when, it, when we're talking about necessary funds to fulfill our, our commitment to our employees, I have to say that under her leadership, her stewardship, again, uh, we have been served extraordinarily well. So I wish you all the best uh, in your endeavors. And it has ac actually been such a pleasure. I will say on behalf of my government operations and fiscal policy committee, colleagues, but also the entire council. It's been really a pleasure to work with you. Thank you so much, Chair Navarro. Uh, we are going to hear from Council Members Friedson and Katz uh, as well, uh, and then I will read the proclamation. Uh, council Member Friedson, followed by Council Member Katz. Thank you, Council President. Sorry, uh, Madam Chair, we couldn't help ourselves uh, in, in uh, uh, bolstering your, your comments. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Linda, for, for all of your work. It's been you know, a privilege and a pleasure to work with you and to have your expertise. And, you know, we've been lucky to have that, but so have the residents of Montgomery County. So have the employees of our workforce to have a secure retirement because of your diligence and your leadership. And you know, I just wanted to note, you know, my pre previous job, I, it, you know, part of my portfolio was the state retirement and pension system. And I can just tell you from a state perspective that Linda uh, really uh, has uh, a reputation uh, across the state and, and throughout the country, uh, really, for uh, her professionalism, for her thoughtfulness, uh, for expertise. Uh, and uh, when the uh, 15th seat was established, 
by the General Assembly in 2013, I believe it was, there really was not a whole lot of conversation and discussion. It was obvious who was going to represent a county perspective on the board. And that speaks to how fortunate we have been to have Linda here in the county. It speaks to how lucky residents are. And you certainly are going to be a significant act to follow. So thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you so much for providing us with your expertise. And we wish you well and sad to see you go. Councilman Marquez. Thank you very much. And I will be very, very brief. But I certainly wanted to take the moment to very publicly thank a lady by the name of Linda Herman for all that she's done. It's been mentioned that you have overseen an investment of more than $8 billion. And we probably owe you 10 billion thank yous. You have done an unbelievably good job. You have worked to reduce fees. You've worked to make certain that the employees and the former employees will have a good life because of the compensations that they will be receiving. And so on behalf of thousands of employees who have decided that public service was something for them, and because of that, you have given them something beyond their public service. So we thank you. And candidly, if there could be a term for an unsung hero, there should be the Linda Herman Award. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you so much. I'm going to read the proclamation and then, Linda, turn it over to you to say a couple of words. First, Proclamation of Montgomery County Council. Whereas in April 2004, Linda Herman was appointed Executive Director of the Montgomery County Employee Retirement Plan, and whereas MCERP is of vital importance to county employees, retirees, and taxpayers, it oversees the investments of assets for the county's pension fund, retirement savings plan, and deferred compensation plan, as well as the Consolidated Retiree Health Benefits Trust for the county, MCPS, and Montgomery College. And whereas from 1999 to her appointment as Executive Director, Linda served as Senior Investment Officer for the board, where she has been responsible for managing the investment programs for the county's defined benefit, defined contribution, and deferred compensation plans. And whereas under Linda's management, total assets have grown from $2.3 billion to $8.1 billion, and the 10-year return of annualized 9.7% ranks in the top decile of the peer group universe. And whereas, unlike the many pension plans across the nation that have suffered from lax administration, and in some cases, malfeasance, MCERP has earned a stellar reputation in all aspects of its work, uh, and there are several other whereases, but I just want to uh, conclude by saying, although, uh, whereas, although her leadership in shepherding the funds, which are some of the most successful public pension funds in the country, will be tremendously missed, we wish Linda all the best in her next endeavor. Now, therefore, it be it resolved that the Montgomery County uh, Council hereby thanks Linda Herman, for serving the county with intelligence, integrity, and innovation, and wishes her all the best as she begins the next chapter in her life. Presented on this 15th day of February in the year 2022, signed by myself. And congratulations, Linda. We, this is bittersweet for us, but we turn it over to you to make some comments. Uh, I think you put yourself on mute. Am I okay now? Uh, we, we're, you're kind of breaking up, now? Both, Linda. Now we can hear you. Try, try. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for your kind and thoughtful comments. It's been a privilege to work with all of you. You know, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, I think it takes a great team to manage successful retirement programs, and I'm very grateful to everyone on our team, our dedicated trustees and staff, our expert investment advisors, the county departments we work with, human resources and payroll in particular, and of course, the county council. You've been a pillar of strength in these very challenging times over the last few decades, and I'm just very honored that I was given the opportunity to work 
at Montgomery County. Thank you so much. And to thank you again, we'll never be able to thank you enough for all of your contributions. Uh, we now move on to the final proclamation before going on to general business, and that is a proclamation recognizing Library Lovers Month by Councilmember Jawando. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, we've had a, a really uh, great morning here. So this this will we'll, we'll be efficient, but also so we've got to celebrate our libraries. Um, and I think we have Sonia Roberts, the chair of the library board, and uh, Ari Brooks, uh, who is the executive director of Friends of the Library with us today. There we go. I see you both. Good to see you. Um, and, you know, uh, this is uh, Library Lovers Month, one of my favorite months as the lead for libraries, even before I was lead for libraries. Um, but boy, if you needed another reason to love our libraries, you got it during the pandemic. Um, you know, not only the core mission of maintaining our history, we talked, we celebrated Black History Month today, and maintaining truth, right? We're at a period of time where that is at at, at risk, uh, and books are being banned, and uh, in neighboring jurisdictions and other places. And our libraries obviously are not partaking in any of that, and are open and have been consistent throughout the free educational resources that you provide, uh, the economic development tool that our libraries, the people can come in, they're open to all, they can upskill. They can apply for that job. I've been, we've gotten tons of stories throughout the pandemic. I read one a few months ago about someone who applied, researched, applied, did their interview and got hired at a public library in Montgomery County um, all, all throughout. Um, and not to mention the literally tens, uh, almost millions, I was trying to get the exact number, but hundreds of thousands of test kits and masks that were distributed over the last several months uh, by our library employees. Um, you know, uh, our libraries have done everything all the time. And uh, so we say thank you. This is a special Library Lovers Month. Uh, you take us on journeys without ever leaving, but you support the community in so many ways as our community hubs. Uh, and I want to thank all the employees and, and all of our residents uh, know how importantly important our libraries are. Um, so visit your local branch. There's 20, we have 21 public branches. Uh, um, I've been to all of them. I've been to the one in, the, in our jail facility as well. They all have something great to offer. Uh, my home branch of Long Branch when I grew up and, uh, and White Oak now, it's, they're awesome branches. So go visit all of them. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll read this proclamation uh, and then I'll turn it over just briefly to, to uh, Ari and Sonia to see if they have, uh, well, they do have something to say, but I'll turn it over to them right after I read. Uh, the proclamation here. Uh, whereas libraries provide unparalleled public services to all of our residents of our county, providing access to new languages, assistance to find jobs, and support for all students. Whereas libraries serve as a vibrant community hub, providing all residents with access to resources that allow them to grow, share, learn, and thrive. And whereas libraries perform a critical role in educating the public and enhancing the culture of our diverse community. And whereas libraries have served as an, an invaluable resource during the COVID-19 pandemic by providing countless public resources, innovating to respond to unprecedented challenges, serving as a distribution hub to pass out free COVID-19 tests and masks. And whereas librarians and educators are keepers of the magic of the written word, and whereas Friends of the Library of Montgomery County is an invaluable nonprofit that supports Montgomery County Public Libraries and promotes the importance of access to lifelong learning, whereas libraries provide us an entryway to new worlds, truths about our past, and equip us with the knowledge we need to build a better, more equitable future, and whereas libraries serve as a safe space in our community for children to grow, learn, and develop their imaginations develop the inquisitive minds we need in the next generation. Therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, recognizes the month of February mm -hmm. as Library Lovers Month signed by the Council President and myself on behalf of the entire Council. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to turn it over first to Sonia and then to Ari, and, and thank you all for all the work that you all do. Um, thank you so much for um, having us today. Um, this is very exciting. Um, especially during Black History Month, that was really um, 
you know, just, it, it held a special place in my heart. So uh, thank you for having us. Um, thank you for uh, recognizing the work of the fabulous uh, library staff, uh, Anita Vasallo and her entire team. Um, they have been all things, especially during the pandemic. Um, and I'm just honored to come before you today uh, during Library Lovers Month. Um, and just to say thank you for um, the council, all of you for supporting um, the work of the library and providing a valuable resource to the entire Montgomery County community and all of the diverse neighborhoods. Um, the library is all things, and uh, that has been a wonderful um, addition to our county. So we thank you for all of the support of uh, Mr. Jawando and of all the county council members. Um, we're excited, uh, the work that the library does in just providing, um, you know, promoting literacy, uh, early childhood education, decreasing the digital divide, and all of the wonderful um, things that the library provides in the community. So thank you for this. We appreciate it. Thank you, Harry. Thank you. Happy Library Lovers Month to everyone. And of course, as a woman of color, I would be remiss without uh, wishing everyone happy Black History Month as well. And I was also, as Sonia mentioned, very proud and very happy to be here and witness that program this morning. Thank you, Mr. Jawando, for your unwavering work to understand the needs of all of the county residents as it pertains to library services, where, of course, you can go and learn about everything from our Black heroes to how to make healthy meals and, and how to be an anti-racist, uh, uh, not, not just this month, but all year long. And I'd uh, especially like to thank the entire county council, President Albernaz and Vice President Glass, for your uh, for this annual recognition of the value of libraries in our community. And I uh, just urge you to continue to support libraries so that they can continue to serve and thrive, um, but particularly serve the entire Montgomery County community. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. And I, I got it from uh, Dr. Stoddard while I was waiting 750,000 test kits, 875,000 masks delivered, passed out by our libraries. And we, we're going to make a little black history at one of our libraries, too, like we do at all of them. And I wrote a letter, and, and many of my colleagues, I think, all support. We're going to be renaming, the county executive has confirmed that we will rename the Silver Spring Library after mm -hmm. recently departed General uh, McGee, uh, Brigadier General McGee. Uh, and so that is really exciting. We're going to have a little, our own black history here uh, at one of our libraries in a very special way. So thank you so much. Uh, back to you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, and thank you to both of you for your public service and your colleagues as well. We are now going to move on to uh, general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Good morning, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Council Members. Uh, there are no announcements, but there is one petition. The County Council has received petitions from the residents of Montgomery County Opposing Bill 4921, Police Accountability Board, Administrative Charging Committee established. That is all, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Uh, just a quick note for my colleagues, logistically, we are going to be shifting one item on the agenda to March 1st. Uh, that is item number seven, the, uh, the briefing on the planning board draft of the Silver Spring and adjacent communities plan. Uh, we still have time before the Fed Committee session on that, and that will uh, free up a little bit more time this afternoon. Um, we, the, the clerk has circulated the minutes of December 7th and January 25th for approval. Are there any changes? Seeing no changes, those minutes are approved. We will now sit as the Board of Health, and uh, we had the shortest presentation we've ever had during our weekly press conferences by Mr. O'Donnell on Monday in part because the numbers uh, are continuing to decline so precipitously, thanks in large part both to our public health officials and but mostly our community uh, who has been adhering to the guidance because of our vaccination rates, because people continue to wear their masks. Uh, we are also joined uh, in addition to our public health officials uh, as we are every couple of weeks by our colleagues in Montgomery County Public Schools. And of course, I'd be remiss once again uh, to not acknowledge uh, the 
historical appointment of Dr. Monifa McKnight as the head of our incredible school system, particularly uh, during Black History Month. And although she's not with us today, uh, we certainly once again send those congratulations and appreciate her leadership in so many ways. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Bridgers, uh, to talk about where we are. Colleagues, obviously, we uh, are, are uh, on a limited time frame today, so I'm going to humbly request that we limit our questions to the five-minute rule, if you have one at all. Um, and so with that, Dr. Bridgers, I turn it over to you. Uh, good morning, uh, Council uh, President Alvernos, uh, Council Vice President uh, Glass, and all of the esteemed uh, council members sitting this morning as a Board of Health. I won't spend a lot of time with my uh, opening remarks. Uh, many of the metrics that Mr. O'Donnell will um, walk through uh, are uh, in the uh, post report and any additional information that Dr. Stoddard has based on our ongoing um, conversations about what it looks like as we move through this fifth wave of um, coronavirus 19 and what it looks like in our way forward. So having said that, um, I wanna thank um, our Montgomery County citizens for being resilient and resourceful. We have gone through uh, four waves and there have been trials and tribulation as I indicated last uh, council session sitting as a board of health in some instances We've taken more uh, <clears throat> conservative uh, postures, uh, moderate postures, and in instances where data and science indicate that we can be more liberal, we've done so. And we're looking at all of those uh, positions as we continue to plan our way forward in the coming months. Um, last month on uh, January the 14th, and looking at some of the data points that I wanted to highlight, we had 503 people hospitalized Yesterday, we had 118 people hospitalized. Conversely, um, yesterday, last month, we had 1,861 um, individual cases per 100,000 and a 22.2% uh, um, test positivity rate. Yesterday, we had 98 cases um, under uh, uh, 3%, um, as Council Member Jawando I would always say in the uh, reports, he's glad to see when we have the lowest test positivity rates in the state, we are below that threshold. This morning when I looked at the data, we were just above three at 3%. So we are trending in the right direction and we need to be reminded of how we got there. We get vaccinated, we get boosted when our time is appropriate. We wear a mask if necessary and we test when needed. So if we remember those things as we continue to move forward and get past this surge, we will be in a safer space as we've been. And that's how we got to our fully vaccinated rate of 84.7%. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, speaking of boosters, we know that there's still um, a need to increase our capacity to boost. So we invite folks to come out and join us. This Saturday, February the 19th at the Westfield Wheaton Mall from 1 to 4 p.m., where we will have yet another Boosterama. And Mr. O'Donnell will go through uh, some of that data and information as well. So with that, I thank everyone for all of their due diligence and great public health work as we continue to move forward and look past Omicron. But we aren't there yet. We There is no uh, 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 clear in per se, but we are moving in the right direction. So I'll stop there, Mr. O'Donnell, and I'll um, turn it over to you to walk us through the Pulse Report. Thank you, Dr. Bridgers. Uh, I just ask if uh, someone could offer me the opportunity to share a screen. Thank you very much. So uh, on the heels of uh, yesterday's media event, I'll, I'll try to see if I can make this as quick as possible again today. Our, our case rates are down to 98 cases per 100,000 over seven days. And our positivity rates are down to 2.99%. Uh, so we're, we're excited about seeing those, those numbers come down. Our vaccination uh, totals, uh, when you round up, we are now at the 85% uh, total of our total population, just a little bit below it. Um, uh, when you look at the, uh, the the fractions, 
We continue to uh, get individuals coming out for boosters, not at a high rate, but that number is uh, inching up a little bit. Now at our 18 and older populations are at 57% uh, boosted. Again, um, our numbers on vaccination types and doses by age, uh, these do trail by a, a week or two as, as it takes a little bit longer to collect this data. But you can see that the, the numbers of, of additional doses has come down um, each week. Uh, looking at uh, one of the things that we highlighted uh, in the previous council sitting as the Board of Health meeting is the disparity in additional doses by, by race and age. Um, we saw over the past week pretty much across the board, uh, all, most of the, the groups went up by about 1%. Um, we're, we're hoping to make more significant progress as uh, we continue to do outreach and um, and try to communicate with all of our populations about the importance of being boosted, particularly with those that are 65 and older um, or with underlying health conditions who are at the most risk for, uh, for, for COVID severe illness. We have not seen much change over the last week in, um, in the where vaccinations are occurring in our county for our five to 11 year olds. Um, that has notably slowed, uh, although we're continuing to work with our uh, MCPS partners on locations throughout the county to, to continue to try to bring out uh, younger children as well as their, their parents and other family members or other people in the community who need a vaccination. Um, I know some of the, these numbers were just shared, but uh, the overall number of rapid test kits distributed is now more than 1.2 million. Uh, throughout our community, the vast majority of those at uh, at libraries, uh, as well as more than 850,000 masks distributed at libraries. Um, we also have had more than 100,000 test kits distributed out to child care, um, our private schools, as well as to our community nonprofits. And another 42,000 have gone out through HHS efforts, um, working with hard to reach communities, uh, homeless populations, senior senior groups. So we've we've pushed out quite a lot of uh, rapid test kits now. One thing that we do want to to share with all of our uh, community, we know there's a lot of interest in the next vaccination um, rollout for those who are under five years old. Uh, we are waiting on the emergency use authorization for a vaccine for that age group. Uh, we expect it will be uh, the six month to um, under five years old population. The FDA was scheduled to meet today. However, they postponed that meeting um, as they've received uh, a lot of new data following the Omicron uh, wave. And uh, the Pfizer has advised them that they are going to continue with a trial of looking at a third dose for that population, um, looking at increasing the efficacy data that has come out. Uh, they expect to have that in early April, and we'll follow along and update the council as we get more information. And just as a reminder, we um, we expect to have about 50,000 children in this age range who, who could be eligible for vaccination once that uh, is approved by our state um, and federal partners. One thing um, that we wanted to provide an update to the council was we have updated our quarantine and isolation guidance uh, late last week. Um, we it is now uh, mirrors the state and federal guidance. Uh, if you recall, we had um, advised having a, a a full 10 day isolation period for those who were under five years old. Um, a lot of that came out of the the fact that the the updated guidance that was occurring from our CDC partners and our state partners happened in the middle of Omicron um, when we felt that it was still a dangerous time to, to return early from isolation for unvaccinated populations. We've seen the data on outbreaks come down significantly over the last few weeks. Um, it was in uh, January, it was over 300 children were in, um, were, were cases within the, the childcare settings. Um, as of a day or two ago, uh, we had under 40 that were currently a case. So it is a very significant change. Um, so now what we've aligned is that uh, for isolation, um, anyone two and older uh, is able to return to 
return from isolation after five days if their symptoms have improved and they know they have not had a fever for 24 hours. Um, however, that's contingent upon being able to wear a mask um, consistently when around other individuals. Um, and uh, for, for the remainder of the 10 days of that isolation period. Um, on return from isolation, continue to wear that those masks, try to avoid being around individuals who are at higher risk. And um, there is guidance in, in those early childhood settings that if uh, during nap times, meals, snacks, those are times when children are not advised to wear um, or unable to wear masks, um, but that those, those early childhood settings try to keep the, the children at least six feet apart if they're in that return from isolation protocol. Um, the same is true if they're returning early from quarantine. Uh, for returning from quarantine, the recommendation um, is, again, children who are under two years of age um, should not return early from quarantine because, again, they're not advised to wear masks in, in any settings, and so they would not meet that, the CDC requirements. Those who are, though, two years and older and, and can consistently wear masks, if um, they have no symptoms, but they're not yet fully vaccinated um, or not boosted, even though they're eligible for boosted, should stay home for five days, um, wear a well-fitting mask around any others, whether at home or, or outside the home. Um, it's recommended uh, that after five days have passed that they, they test, and if that's negative, um, they, can, they can leave isolation, um, but they should continue to monitor for symptoms, and if, if they do develop symptoms, um, isolate and, and retest. Uh, again, for that period of time, uh, individuals who return from quarantine um, un under the, the 10 days should avoid being around people who are at high risk and try to avoid travel if they can. And then for those who are fully vaccinated or um, eligible for boosters and have gotten boosted, they do not need to quarantine um, for those first five days. But for those full 10 days, they should wear a mask when around others. Again, monitor for symptoms. Uh, avoid people high risk, avoid travel. And again, they're recommended uh, to test on day after day five, if possible. And finally, uh, those who have tested positive for COVID within the last 90 days, if they are exposed to someone else, it's the same guidance as far as not needing to quarantine, um, but for 10 days to wear masks and, and monitor for symptoms. Again, avoid being around people who are high risk and avoid travel. They do not, um, they're not recommended to test after uh, five days. Uh, again, it's it's considered um, that they're they're protected because of their recent uh, recovery from from COVID. Uh, and then, as as Dr. Bridgers mentioned, there is a booster rama that is occurring this Saturday um, uh, through our partnership with Salute Bienestar and Proyecto Salud. Uh, they will be at the Westfield Wheaton Mall between one and four p.m. Um, in addition to giving boosters. Um, they, they will be able to give uh, first or second doses uh, if that's something you need um, with the vaccine they have on hand. Uh, additionally, they'll have some rapid test kits and some N95 masks to give away to folks who have come to get vaccinated. So those are the uh, updates that we have from public health. Um, at this point, we'd like to turn it over to Dr. Stoddard if he has anything to add. Just one comment. Uh, I know that on social media there was a lot of discussion about the spectator rules with our uh, recreation programming. Obviously, those will begin to shift. We've already talked about them. Those will begin to shift as the mask mandate ends. And so you can expect to see an announcement or some changes in those spec those spaces moving forward. MCPS, you know, obviously has been increasing their spectator allowance for each of the last several weeks, and we'll be going back to I believe 100% uh, later later uh, over the next several weeks. And so just wanted to make that clear that those those changes were already happening in the background, but obviously for the public's benefit to understand that along the same line timelines of the mask mandate. So. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you. Uh, Mr. D'Andrea, uh, what's uh, MCPS's update? And if you can include in your update, Mr. D'Andrea, uh, among the questions we're getting asked the most among constituents is what happens to the mask mandate among students and uh, faculty and staff after the 21st? If you could just remind everyone what that process is and how those decisions are made, we'd appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Good morning, President Albernos, Vice President Glass, and members of the council. Um, we will be very brief in our update, and we did plan to touch on the mask piece at the end of the update. Um, thankfully, as has been noted in multiple situations, um, the data has improved dramatically since January. So we will briefly touch base on the data and then just talk about a few other uh, common questions that we've been receiving. So in terms of our overall COVID-19 case rates, um, this data just reflects information from right after we came back from winter break that first week when we had more than 10,000 cases reported. And then you can see the past two weeks where obviously case numbers have gone down significantly um, to 455 and 353 respectively. And when we look at that on a day-to-day -day basis, you can see that very thankfully, um, when we were here two weeks ago, we were happy to say that the numbers had declined significantly. Those numbers have continued to decline even more if you look at the progress over the past couple of weeks. Um, and we are very grateful for the partnership with DHHS and working together to impl implement mitigation measures that that have helped in um, making this possible. As a result of um, obviously the challenges that we went through in January with the Omicron variant and really reflecting on and learning from those, we are in receipt of the uh, information that was sent over yesterday evening regarding endemic health planning. And we're looking forward to the conversations with the council in March, where we talk about the work that we have been doing and will continue to be doing around what we have learned from what occurred with the tremendous spike in cases in January. And more importantly, how we're moving forward and the steps that we're taking as we think about health planning more broadly as part of the overall school system operations. So I just want to mention that we are looking forward to those upcoming discussions and that's something that we have been working on and take very seriously because as we move forward and as Dr. McKnight has repeatedly said, you know, throughout this entire pandemic, our goal has been to learn from all the different things that have been happening, improve our processes and make sure that we are prepared moving forward. I do want to just briefly touch base on one item that I mentioned the last time that we were here in terms of the at home rapid test kit distribution. Um, we are very grateful that DHHS continues to provide 50,000 rapid test kits each week to us. And as a result, using those rapid test kits, plus some that we have procured separately, we are distributing rapid test kits to all students every three weeks uh, through the month of March, which gives us spot checks on a periodic basis. Um, when people take the test and obviously report their positive results. Clearly, the numbers have continued to stay very low in alignment with the county numbers, but we recognize that this is one important overall mitigation measure. In addition, when we talk about things that we have learned from past experiences and I know there were a lot of conversations about winter break and a return from winter break. We are making preparations so that we can distribute at home rapid test kits prior to spring break and ask students to uh, take those rapid test kits at the end of spring break prior to returning. Um, this is obviously one key measure that we were not able to do during winter break due to the availability of tests. Um, but just as we think more broadly about next steps moving forward, this is a really important next step and one example of kind of that overall health planning. And then we are continuing to have staff and students report their positive results through our COVID-19 reporting tool. That tool will be upgraded in the coming weeks, um, but right now it is a way for us to be able to monitor uh, the cases in the school system. We had started that prior to winter break and it was very helpful for us to have that data and obviously be able to share that data with all of you as well. Um, the last piece I'll mention, just recognizing that we are short on time, is that we are very thankful that this is the second week that all schools continue to be in person. Um, those schools are currently in uh, temporary virtual learning due to COVID or staffing disruptions. Um, and we are very optimistic that this will continue, but we are continually monitoring the data. In addition, as I shared, the last time that we were here, all of our bus routes continue to be served. Um, we obviously had significant challenges during the first three weeks of January, but those have improved significantly since that time. This doesn't mean that there are not still regular delays and other bus challenges that have always been the case um, due to weather or accidents or things like that. But at the end of the day, all of our routes are served and there are no route cancellations. And then going back to what President Alberno said at the beginning. So when the mask mandate um, is scheduled to expire for the county on February 21st, our mask mandate will stay in effect. No decisions have been made just yet regarding changes to the mask requirement in all MCPS facilities. We are currently reviewing the guidance that's provided by the Maryland State Department of Education. And we will be discussing this further um, at our Board of Education meeting next Thursday. Thursday as well, um, and then we'll keep the uh, council updated on the progress of those discussions. So with that, I will turn it back to you, President Albertos. Thank you so much, Mr. D'Andrea. i uh, got a couple of um, hands up from colleagues. Council Member Friedson. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, very glad to see where the numbers are. I think we're all excited about that and very, you know, relieved that all schools are, are in person as, as a result. So. 
uh, happy to see that. Thank everybody for their uh, their, their work and, and their efforts. Um, also wanted to thank uh, Council President Albernaz and uh, Chair Rice for the endemic planning memo that was sent and uh, that was referenced here. And I just think that that's a, a good approach as we move forward. And I'm glad also to hear that MCPS uh, is uh, already looking at uh, spring break, which you know, we need to plan ahead of time and, and glad to hear that, that those plans are, are underway and, and working with the health department to make sure you have the test kits and other uh, you know, materials and resources that you need in order to, to implement those plans ahead of time. So just want to acknowledge uh, and, and, and thank that. Um, appreciate the update on the uh, mask uh, decisions related to public schools. I just wanted to get a sense of uh, whether or not the health department was intending to make a recommendation or whether MCPS was going to request a recommendation from the health department or if this was going to be a decision uh, that the school board was going to make uh, pursuant to the uh, to the state uh, guidance that was uh, provided recently. Good morning, Councilmember Friedson, and thank you for that question. I should have been more explicit when I said that we're discussing this and we'll be discussing with the Board of Education next week. Um, working with the Department of Health and Human Services is a critical part of that process. So absolutely, um, they are, uh, will be part of those discussions um, and we very much rely on their recommendations and advice as we have throughout the pandemic. Councilmember Friedson, I, I've been in conversations with um, Dr. McKnight regarding um, the governor's uh, charge to MSDE, the questions therein, and so we've been having conversations of how that would look like the, the metrics that are set forth, 80% of being the population being fully vaccinated or two week period. So as Ms. DeAndrea said, we are having conversations and we um, will continue to look at the data and, and share those recommendations with the council sitting as a board of health once we decided the best way forward. Appreciate that. Given that there, there have been thresholds that were identified at the state level, if there are gonna be different thresholds that the health department is going to recommend and that ultimately uh, MCPS, you know, may or may not follow. I think it's important that they be communicated uh, clearly and publicly you know, what they are, how they differ, uh, you know, if they differ, and uh, you know what we're going to be uh, determining uh, that decision uh, based off of. So, you know, I think that will help the school board make its decision, and that will certainly help residents understand uh, what decision uh, is made. And obviously, there's you know mixed opinions on like all of these uh, issues, and, and I, I certainly understand and appreciate that, but I think it's very important that uh, if there are uh, recommendations that are coming uh, from the health department to uh, MCPS that uh, they be uh, you know, discussed publicly and, and shared publicly so that everybody understands uh, what the decision is uh, based off of. So I would appreciate that. Uh, similarly, related to childcare, could, could you just explain, you know, we, we talked today about the quarantine and isolation uh, matching the uh, state standards. Uh, could you discuss uh, once the uh, indoor mask mandate uh, is uh, expired, uh, you know, a week from, uh, you know, next week, uh, you know, on the 21st, uh, what does that mean for child care facilities uh, in the county uh, and, and uh, independent schools, you know, separate from MCPS? So thank you, Council. Friedson again for that question. I'll have Mr. O'Donnell walk through that again, but simply put, it means that masks will still be required for those individuals who are in child care settings. As Mr. O'Donnell indicated, we, we still see some part of uh, those individuals who are unvaccinated, who are under five, still um, a testing positive uh, for the coronavirus through PCR tests. Um, one of the opening comments that I indicated is that uh, earlier in the summer, uh, as we planned for our five to 11 year old vaccination, I talked about modeling behavior. And so I, I um, recommend that our, our parents and our family members continue to model that behavior for those individuals who are unvaccinated and who should still wear a mask according to CDC uh, throughout um, until they uh, are eligible for vaccination. And so we've set those guidelines as, as set forth, um, as previously recommended, as Mr. DeAndre also indicated, is that as we assess um, and have conversations about um, MCPS's public uh, uh, mask wearing mandate and um, 
the details of that, we will take those into consideration. But for those individuals who are under five year of age, they will still be required to wear a mask. Mr. O'Donnell, you want to walk through that again? I don't know if you want to bring up the slide so that we could get a visual and just hit those highlighted points again for Council Member Friedson in response to this question. As you do that, and this is my final question, Mr. President, thanks for that. Just to clarify, it will be guidance to these child care facilities, not a requirement. Sure, absolutely. To private schools. You're providing your best guidance on what you believe, based on your medical expertise and that of the team that you are consulting, but ultimately a decision subsequent to the lifting of the indoor mask mandate would be up to the individual facilities. Is that accurate? That's correct. There are currently private schools that are going mask optional in Montgomery County today, so we're clear. So we know that those are already happening. Obviously, we have not stepped in to intervene to stop those schools. So just so we're clear that we know that that is happening already, and so that obviously is the prerogative of the facilities. Correct, unless there's an outbreak, and then we will take the appropriate public health response to mitigate and suppress that outbreak in that setting. If you want to add anything, that's fine, but that's all I have in terms of questions, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Mr. O'Donnell, do you want to speak to this? I was just going to clarify that the difference is our guidance here was a return from isolation or quarantine where a mask would be, would be, our guidance would be is recommended that they wear a mask in those settings, but as opposed to talking about individuals who are not returning from isolation or quarantine where when that mask mandate goes away and when the guidance from MSDE and Maryland Department of Health changes for school and early childhood. So just differentiating between those two, the folks who are coming back from a confirmed COVID diagnosis or an exposure to COVID, wearing masks versus those who are not in that category. I appreciate that, Mr. O'Donnell, and just to follow up on Councilmember Friedson's point, I know this is, if we can just make that information as clear as possible and on the website, we continue to get questions. We'll probably get many more after the 21st. If we could just refer easily somewhere or to someone, that would be helpful so we don't inundate you all more than you're already inundated. I have Councilmember Reamer followed by Councilmember Jawando, and then we're going to try to wrap up our public health briefing and move on to district council session. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Could you just say again, I think I missed it. After the 21st, what will be the status of mask requirements for private schools and daycare settings, child care settings? I'll speak to private schools, and we've had a conversation with the council. We've never applied the existing mask mandate as a requirement in private school settings. Okay. Just so we're clear about that. Most have obviously followed the mandatory requirements, and I think up until recently, I think I'm aware of at least one of larger private high schools that has now moved into a mask optional stage, which is certainly currently, I mean, as in before the 21st, they've already done that. And so, you know, it's been our view from the county attorney that, you know, and having spoken to council, various, you know, council staff and members, it wasn't the intent for necessary to apply to private school settings. So we have not enforced it in the private school settings. And so obviously after the 21st, the same, that obviously would apply. And so for the child care, it's the same, except for there are specific rules around returning from quarantine or isolation where masking is applied. And there may be also recommendations on top of that. So it depends, you know, obviously the, we're sort of waiting to see what will happen with MSD and Maryland Department of Health guidance. But I think generally speaking, you're correct. There will be, there may be guidance or recommendations that are made about various, you know, settings and kinds of things like that. But there will be no requirements. Okay. I just want to say this again. This is very interesting. It hadn't occurred to me until this morning. So effective, well, you've said that they're all, private schools are already not subject to our county mask requirements. So private schools have always been at their own discretion, unless it was mandated by the state or something like that. So, however, 
daycare and, and pre-K has been covered by the county requirement and that will change effective the 21st? So go, ahead, go ahead, Dr. Bridge. Sure. Go ahead, Dr. Sauter. Uh, I'm speaking specifically to the recommendations that we continuously uh, revise based on CDC and MSD guidance. Again, we will have a conversation with MCPS to look at those guidance and or recommendations consistent with what they've uh, indicated as as you uh, uh, reference, uh, Council Member Rima, regarding those isolation and quarantine guidelines. They will still be in place until we make the recommendations to our child care providers. We're also preparing additional information to coincide with the mask mandate uh, sunsetting or expiring on the 21st to make it clear. We're also having a conversation with our early child uh, uh, child care team at HHS to make sure that folks are, are communicated or receive that communication in a timely manner, as Council Member Fritz and I often talked about. So we're putting that together. But the answer to your question is it will remain consistent with the either the M MCPS policy or the county policy, unless there's a situation where there's an isolation or quarantine recommendation in place. So if the child care is in an MCPS building, it would be subject to MCPS rules. If it's in a private setting, it would be optional according to the county's rules with, again, not, not in, including specific guidance for cases and how cases are handled and isolation and guidance uh, in quarantine. That's very interesting. Um, thank you. Um, uh, so I wanted to you know, continue on that thread here um, in that I, I, I want to see us allowing tests to stay uh, for childcare as we proceed. And I, I know there, it must be challenging. I'm sure there are complications, but um, you know, fortunately cases are down so much that I think the impact of not allowing tests to stay has been reducing, you know, it's been declining, the impact has been declining, but, uh, you know, to require entire classes to uh, isolate um, or just not be able to, you know, go into class um, is when, when they could test to remain um, just seems to be not providing enough of an allowance for families and for centers to use a testing regime, uh, which, you know, many, many health public health advocates are saying, or public health experts are saying, just, just do symptomatic. Don't even rely on tests to say, just do symptomatic uh, evaluation to stay. But we're not, we're not embracing that here in the county, but I think we ought to embrace test to stay. And, and, Again, learning that younger children will be um, absent some new regulation will not be subject. You know, I, I think that um, I think that's going that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I also think we've got a bigger job here to do to explain to families and to kids these relative risks. And um, you know, on the positive side, like young kids who are are safer than vaccinated adults. So it makes sense that when vaccinated adults don't, aren't required to mask, that young kids would not be required to mask. Uh, they're just more protected by virtue of all kinds of factors that you know better than I do, but I'm just referring to the, to the data. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, I've had some interesting experiences talking to students about masking. And as part of my concern about school safety, I've been, as I've mentioned, volunteering in my kids' schools just to be an adult, you know, positive presence at the school setting. And uh, I've had a chance to sit down and talk to a lot of students about masking. And I've said, hey, if masking was optional, would you still mask? And, you know, perhaps the responses that I get are reflective of the specific community of that school. Um, I, I'm sure that's the case. But students were universally saying, absolutely, I'll continue to mask. And the reason is that they feel very unsafe. You know, they feel, they, they feel very threatened, of course, by the virus. And I know we are hearing from a lot of parents who don't feel that way. But as we are grappling with this really complex issue, 
I think our kids need to hear from the county as to their level of safety and protection. And as cases are declining, and thankfully they are declining. And when we get to the point, I mean, what was the number? 26 cases in MCPS yesterday? Was that the number? Right. I mean, that's we got 160,000 students. Now, I guess we didn't test all 160,000, but the point is that's really low. We're down to 26 cases, you know, in the whole school system. Um, we've got to be able to help our students feel safer and feel to take these steps uh, towards normalcy. So I know there's been a memo that has gone from Chair Rice and the council president about, you know, planning for endemic thinking and, 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 and programming. programming. But I, uh, and I think at a high level, that's the same idea here is we are, we are fortunately moving into a period of, you know, much significant decline in the level of transmission and, and a, a general reality of being really much safer. And we need to tell that to our families and to our kids so that when it's time to take some of these more, um, you know, significant steps like making masking optional, that they'll feel that that's because it is safer, not because a bunch of adults want them to, you know, take an action that right. is related to some other agenda. <laughs> so yeah. that's, you know, that's what I wanted to kind of convey. And I, and I don't know how we do that precisely, but we've got to, we've got to talk to the kids and engage with the kids and help them understand the risks so that they know that they're, they're, they're going to be safe. It's going to be okay. It, it's a really good point, Councilmember Reamer. I think that uh, moving forward, uh, we absolutely need to address those issues. Um, and thank you for those questions and comments. We now have Councilmember Jawando, uh, and then we're going to wrap up our public health briefing and move on to our district council session. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Appreciate the conversation. And as always, thank you for the work that our public health team and our schools are doing. Um, Mr. DeAndrea, my uh, my daughters happily put on their N95s this morning, issued from school, and they're and, and they're quite fashionable as well. So they're very happy to to have those. Um, so I'm, I'm sure there's a, they're not alone as far as the students happy to have those. So and just if you could remind our residents, uh, my understanding is that those are going to be issued a pack of a week for the next couple of weeks. I don't want to misstate it, but can you just remind people what the issuance of those is going to be? The, uh, good morning, Councilmember Joando. The original plan has always been to make sure that students have at least one mask per week in alignment with the county. Obviously, we give them out and set so that they can rotate them over the course of the week and multiple weeks. Got it. Perfect. Yeah, and it's like a pack of five or something like that. So to rotate them, you know, wear them across multiple weeks and rotate them out. Okay. I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing nodding, and I saw nodding from two from Miss Izzard as well. Okay, um, and uh, I, I think the also, are we any update from General Counsel on the while the cases are going down? That's great. Uh, obviously, there's more than 26 cases because we're not tested. We don't have a, a robust enough testing to know exactly how many. The guidance being updated is awesome as well that you don't have to quarantine. So all good things. But anything on the ability to test more in the issue with the state guidance. Have we made any progress on that? So we have made progress in terms of increasing testing, albeit slowly by adding um, an additional vendor. And I know that there are further conversations happening with other vendors to be able to increase the amount of overall testing in terms of the conversation about opting out versus opting in in terms of parent consent. There is definitely a lot of work that's happening behind the scenes on that front. Um, to this point, we have realized that um, it's been very challenging to find any vendor that is interested and would be willing to move forward with our uh, plan of being able to, or possibility of being able to do an opt-out model, but we are looking into some additional possibilities and we'll make sure to keep um, you and the other members of the council updated on that. Okay, I appreciate that. And I, and again, I've said this from the beginning, I think that's not, hopefully we're, we, not hopefully, we are heading in the right direction, but this is for, this is long-term we need to figure this out. There will be other, issues we're going to need to so i think this is something that we need to figure out to have this capability a tool in the toolbox for obviously potentially another variant but also down the line so i appreciate you still working on that um my last question uh mr stoddard and i might i don't think i missed this but the issue of youth sports uh you know uh and and attendance 
uh, and, and masking there, uh, you know, I'm glad, I'm happy my daughter's playing youth basketball again, and, but I'm the only one that can go with her and other people want to come. Uh, could you just address that? I know you're, you were going to be sending over some updated guidance is my understanding, but could you address the attendance issue and the masking issue with youth sports? Yeah, we had already begun talking about uh, participating in rec programming, uh, indoor indoor spectators for youth sports. I know MCPS is looking at that same issue as well. I think MCPS has been expanding. They started at 25% capacity, they've gone to 50. I think there was an intentionality to get to, to 100% there. Uh, I expect we're going to be having some – we're working through the details because obviously different settings have different capacities, and the question ultimately becomes you know, how you make it work in every setting. But uh, the intention is to obviously – Move forward with the, without the mask mandate next week. I do believe that we will not be having a mask mandate that subject to some final review and discussion around uh, county buildings or county uh, record libraries, but uh, still reviewing that. And then obviously um, spectators will increase thereafter. So I think that's always been the intention is to increase. As the surge came down, as we get to a better place, as we remove mask mandates, the intention was to remove other restrictions as well. Dr. Bridges and I have been actively engaging with departments to make sure that there weren't restrictions that we didn't know about and obviously if there were restrictions of any kind we wanted to know about them and make sure that they still made sense if they made sense and try and roll back as many of those as we recently could so that's that's the intention and how yeah, soon just just to press you on the timing how soon can we expect to have a change there yeah i think you'll hear about it when we meet next week obviously mass mandate will be lifted right. by the next week we'll so. yeah we'll be able to we'll be able to provide we'll be able to provide updates on any of those additional restrictions Perfect. on the time so council so member juana let me just add we will be measured. We want to make sure there's still, even though there's a lower community transmission level, we want to be measured to make sure that we hear the responses from the community, such as recreation um, and other agencies, as well as how that will look. So we're looking at not only how, how it will happen, but what data will impact it happening faster. So that's part of the plan. I wanted to share that as part of that update. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, we've always been measured. I think I think that's served us well. So I appreciate that. But it's time to move in that direction, and I'm, I appreciate you acknowledging that. And Thank you, Mr. Do, what, what, yes, one, you didn't ask about this, but since you are, you know, obviously the library's lead, I will tell you that you'll be seeing an announcement about Sunday library hours later today. Oh, you uh, you made my day and all of our days. So thank you for thank you for bringing that up, and uh, that is great news as well so okay. just to repeat that for anyone listening sunday hours coming back later today all right well great. yeah we'll have an announcement later today but later but, but let's put it this way i'll tell you i'll give you a little sneak preview it's this month that we'll be reopening libraries on public space so awesome awesome yeah. thank you thank you mr president it's a good valentine's day gift um uh, councilmember navarro is going to have the last word in our uh, public health briefing councilmember navarro thank you mr president uh, very quickly uh, to, of course, acknowledge, because it's important to acknowledge uh, where we are and to thank everyone, and of course, most importantly, our residents for hanging in there and um, getting us to this point. Also, just want to publicly thank uh, Council uh, President and, and Chairman Rice for sending that memo requesting the endemic um, briefing that Council Member Friedson and I had um, respectfully requested that we began to discuss. I think a lot of the questions that have been asked today are definitely part of that exercise. And I believe that it will serve us well to begin this conversation and to begin to also in some ways memorialize how we will be operating in case, heaven forbid, there's just another spike or something else that comes along our way. So I wanna thank everyone for um, you know, agreeing to, to do this. I know everybody's so busy, but it is critical I think that we start to think through what the endemic stage uh, will look like um, and, and to prepare for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, well, well, thank you to all our public health officials and uh, MCPS colleagues. We, of course, are on recess next week, so we will not be seeing you, but I know we will be in contact and communication and we appreciate your leadership. And this morning's tribute was so poignant uh, and this briefing just speaks to it. So thank you all. Uh, colleagues, we will now move on to item number three, uh, sitting as uh, the district uh, for our district council section. Uh, item 1A is a work session and action on a zoning text amendment 2109 office and professional biohealth priority campus. Uh, our Fed committee uh, deliberated and recommends approval with amendments. I will turn to uh, Chair Reamer to set this up for us and yield to him to uh, yield to the build co-leads and sponsors uh, to, to speak to it as well. But uh, Chairman Reamer. 
Perfect. Thank you. Um, I will uh, share the committee's recommendation and uh, turn it to the uh, the leads for their observations or comments as well. Um, and I just wanted to uh, begin um, with a little bit of uh, background about our efforts on life sciences and biotech, because it's been a huge focus for the Fed Committee, the Economic Development Committee. And I think this is going to be one of the signature items of this term's work on these important issues. Um, and I'm really excited. I appreciate Councilmember Friedson taking the initiative to craft this proposal. It's a good one. Um, and it's going to help meet a, a real need for us. Uh, particularly as we are in a surging investment environment to be competitive, uh, to offer a speed to market that can match what smaller jurisdictions do or bigger jurisdictions. Um, and I think that's the, you know, one of the cores of the issue. We've heard from a lot of private sector, uh, you know, leaders that the time that it takes to go from I've got a breakthrough, a scientific breakthrough. I need a lab space and I need to hire up. It's just too long in Montgomery County. It takes too long. Uh, and as a result, that company, which needs to move fast, is going to look somewhere else. Um, so we got to solve that problem. And I think that's what I know this, that's what this is about. Um, and this proposal comes within context of a, a number of important changes that we have made to promote the density of our life science sector. You know, we look to Massachusetts as a model uh, for how life sciences can lead an economic renaissance. You know, Boston is a great example of a community that has really taken off over the years thanks to its prioritization of life sciences. And we can do the same thing here. You know, that's, that's what we've been working towards at the committee. And uh, we have great opportunities to get our life sciences cluster, you know, higher on the global rankings. Um, and that can help us compete as our economy has really faded in most other areas, I think, in this county in the face of competition from Northern Virginia. Uh, we do have a bright spot. We've got an all-star on the team, and we need to uh, get that player in. So uh, that's what a focusing on life sciences is all about. But we've got incredible programs going with biohealth innovation, my colleagues remember the, the work that we did to uh, put a partnership in place with BHI that had uh, kind of faded, um, and we, we resuscitated that and brought it more resources, um, and that's an important partner for us in the Maryland Technology Council. Uh, we've, we're working closely with them to leverage their expertise. We funded a uh, task force on resiliency that actually went on to get a federal grant, a multi-million dollar federal grant to help local entrepreneurs uh, in the wake of COVID to, um, you know, accelerate their working. Uh, we are remaking our SBIR grants and trying to target our county resources to the better points in that process for entrepreneurs to get their companies off the ground. And we've got some of the region's best thinkers, really nationally best thinkers, working with us at MCEDC to figure out how to make more progress in the sector and tackling challenging issues, for example, like conflict of interest rules that are preventing local entrepreneurship in our powerful uh, federal research labs. So um, we've taken on the development limits that were blocking future growth in Gaithersburg, uh, and we've opened that area up for more development, and um, that's going to be terrific and Councilmember Rice, we've been working on life sciences uh, workforce partnerships with MCPS and the college and Shady Grove and WorkSource Montgomery, and we're making a lot of strides there. We've revisited and rewritten the rules to incentivize development in opportunity zones in Montgomery County, removing the impact tax cost burden on projects in our opportunity zones, which we especially hope is going to make a big difference in White Oak near FDA, where we have the opportunity to uh, really um, have a strong cluster there if we can get the private sector rolling. So all of that is happening. Um, and in, 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 you know, in this context, as I said, 
a ZTA that is intended to allow private investment to proceed without without barrier, you know, without needless process and endless endless revision, um, but to come into the county and get to market uh, in a timely manner. So uh, uh, that's my broader frame. I'd like certainly to invite the sponsor, uh, Mr. Freitzen, to uh, share his comments, and then we can turn it to staff to get into the specifics of the ZTA. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I am proud to, to serve on this body and to work with colleagues in the executive branch and planning in the private sector uh, to really make the strides that we have in, in bio. And really what this effort is, is, uh, you know, an effort to double down on that strength, that global leadership in life sciences and industry uh, that in Montgomery County is not just creating jobs, it's saving lives. And it's revolutionizing uh, the way in which we uh, we live and 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 the manner in which we can live uh, better and, and healthier lives and uh, this CTA creates a, a green taping a expedited regulatory review process for biohealth facilities of 150,000 square feet or more for uh, new uh, uh, you know attraction efforts and 50,000 square feet uh, or more uh, for expansions of our existing. Uh, biohealth facilities, uh, as colleagues noted, and I appreciate everybody's co-sponsorship. Uh, it uh, is modeled after the Amazon uh, efforts that the prior council put into place. Uh, and we uh, took the uh, thoughtful way that that was handled and tried to uh, adapt it to uh, the needs of uh, one of our most important strategic uh, industries, uh, which, you know, to me uh, was, uh, you know, something that, that made sense. We didn't, uh, uh, create a new wheel. We just repurposed uh, a wheel that we already had for uh, a core strength uh, that we can build on. And, and really, that's what our economic development uh, efforts uh, should uh, should focus on. Uh, we, we did it in a way that uh, focuses on where our biohealth strength currently is, uh, and also uh, prioritized uh, opportunity zones, equity emphasis areas, uh, and uh, bus rapid transit including the CCT, which was intended in the original drafting, and we uh, added belts and suspenders, uh, which I appreciated uh, Councilmember Rice, understandably, uh, had, uh, had uh, requested. Uh, and just to give a, a sense here, uh, this takes a, a standard process that is estimated to take about 600 days uh, in terms of regulatory review, and it cuts it down by almost 75% uh, to about 160 days. Uh, and there's always, already been significant efforts by the planning department who deserve a lot of credit uh, for really streamlining our efforts. And this really builds upon that and takes an even more aggressive approach uh, for this uh, in, uh, strategic industry uh, that we have focused so much of our economic development uh, emphasis uh, on. And so I just wanted to thank uh, the executive agencies, thank the planning department in particular and council staff for, for all the work uh, here. Uh, we uh, have a great industry that we can build on. And this is one example of how this council uh, is uh, making sure that uh, we are uh, taking some of the things uh, that we have in Montgomery County and making them even better. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, we yield back uh, to uh, the chair uh, and to council staff so we can uh, go through this, uh, this packet and, and look forward to uh, the uh, approval of this important measure uh, by colleagues. Thank you, sir. All right, so uh, once again, the proposal creates a accelerated approval process for a project that is a a new a new build essentially like a new building uh, of was it 150,000 square feet, Councilman Friedson? I think that's right. Or that's for a company that is new uh, to the county, or the expansion of an existing facility by 50,000 square feet or more. So when we have a big project, then we can be all hands on deck and need a 60 day turnaround timeline uh, that is market competitive. Um, so <clears throat> I, I don't know how much council members wanna go into, you know, very specific clauses of the zoning text amendment. We can hear from planning about their ability to meet these goals. And uh, then we can proceed to see what other council members uh, may wish to, to bring up in this context, so. Uh, Lavu, I'll turn it to you now, um, and thank you for your work on the packet, and uh, we'll get into details as, as needed. 
So the brief overview is it will create, this will create a whole new use termed the BioHealth Priority Campus that will be allowed in the CR, EOF, as well as the LSC zone. And the business use must fit under life sciences, research and development, or medical, scientific, manufacturing, and production. The application requirements will be similar to that of a site plan. The planning board will have to hold a hearing within 60 to 65 days of when the application is accepted. And then reviewing agencies will have 15 days to submit comments. A few changes that were made during the Fed Committee session were, again, including CCT explicitly, adding LSC zones. And then if an applicant fails to comply with the deadlines, the application is revoked unless they request a reinstatement from the planning board by showing good cause for missing that deadline. And other than that, that's the brief overview, unless council members have specific questions and I can go through it in a more detailed fashion. Thank you so much, Ms. Nadu. I think what we'll do is it would be good to hear briefly from Chairman Anderson and Director Wright, just from their perspective and confirming their ability to meet this objective. And then I have Council Member Jawando in the queue next. So, Ms. Chairman Anderson. Thank you. We applaud this effort to streamline the development review process for important economic development projects. We will be challenged to meet these deadlines, but we believe we're up to that challenge. We just need to manage that process and we will be working with the council closely to make sure if there are impacts on staffing or resources that we can address those as appropriate. Director Wright, did you want to add anything? No, I think the chair addressed everything appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Jawando, you are in the queue next. Thank you. Appreciate the effort here and glad we're going to pass the CTA as a co-sponsor. I'm very supportive of it. And we had a good discussion in Fed. One of the things that has not been mentioned here to four is the racial equity statement, which made some suggestions and had some concerns about exacerbating racial inequity because this industry, which is an all-star industry that we want to expand, is not diverse and has challenges like many of our industries because the history and legacy of discrimination in this country, as we discussed in a very thorough way this morning. And one of the suggestions that was in the racial equity statement, which I have attempted to build upon in the Fed committee, but also in then slightly modified here today, is to locate, incentivize locating these really important industries, biohealth facilities in areas that have been historically underinvested in, in communities of color. And a proxy for that in this ZTA, which I really appreciate the lead sponsors, including is opportunity zones, which we have several here in the county. And this allows for these to be located, this expedited review in opportunity zones, along with all the other areas, the rent policy areas, the bus, the within a half mile of transit, which is a lot of the county as well, bus rapid transit as well. So it puts it on par. But when we talk about racial equity, it's not enough to put it on par. You have to go a step further to address the deep inequities that are present. And you're not going to do it with one tool, right? You know, this is one ZTA, one tool, one effort. You're going to need to do a lot of other things, which the racial equity statement mentions. And I know colleagues have worked on, and I'm also going to be supportive of those, of giving some financial incentives for people to move into this industry. And to, you know, I know there was some issue with the move program. We had to pull the agenda item that was going to be introduced today, but we'll figure out a way to make sure that there are financial incentives, but we're going to have to do a whole package of things because the inequities are so systemic and so deep that every time we have an opportunity, we have to embed racial equity into every proposal in a deep and meaningful way. And so what I proposed in committee was to take a tiered process of having it to be 60 days, or sorry, 90 days down from 120 for every other area in 60 days for opportunity zones. There were some concerns raised. We had a good discussion about, well, we want to go down even further. 
uh, to get competitive with other jurisdictions. So uh, definitely heard that. Uh, and as is in the packet, uh, have worked with staff and, and others. I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Nadu and others for helping with this and doing some research uh, to keep it at 60 days for everywhere in the ZTA that it, that it already says, but for opportunity zones, go to 45 days. And again, we don't have that many, but they are, you know, one of the good and bad things about segregation uh, is that it's I, these are compact areas and we know where they are. Uh, and it's the maps that we're all familiar with. And this would bring it down to 45 days within an opportunity zone um, and still keep the, the baseline of 60 in the amendment and not change that in the overall ZTA. Um, and this could further incentivize biohealth facilities to locate in these opportunity zones while still keeping the 60 day process everywhere else. Um, and if you look at neighboring jurisdictions, last thing I'll say on this amendment, and I'm proposing this amendment, is uh, if you look at neighbors in Frederick County, their normal process is 90 days, um, but they have a 45 day, uh, sim same as I'm proposing, expedited process. Um, if you look at BC, they have a standard seven week, 49 day approval process. And so I think given the size of these areas, um, and um, the uh, that it won't be a lot of them, but it will create an additional incentive to locate in a opportunity zone. And I think it's very doable. So um, for all those reasons, uh, I'd like to recommend to colleagues and move that we uh, keep the baseline 60 days, but for opportunity zones, move it down to 45 days. And Ms. Ledoux has a, uh, the language in the packet that would be needed to accomplish that. Before the formal amendment, uh, which in the motion, Councilmember Juando, um, um, before we get to that, just but uh, there's a couple more comments just by on background. Sure. Uh, this is sure. The amendment, and then after those comments on background, then absolutely that motion will apply, and we'll seek a second for that motion. But I know Councilmember Friedson uh, also wanted to talk uh, more broadly uh, about some of that background and context within the discussion. Um, so, Councilmember Friedson, I yield to you. Um, and then Chairman Reamer, and then after those two comments, we will then formally have the motion on the floor. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawanda. I really appreciate it. We had a really good discussion in, in committee uh, on, on this, uh, and I uh, appreciate this uh, refined uh, uh, amendment that is uh, put forward. Uh, you know, I, I have been working with uh, Councilmember Navarro and, and Councilmember Jawanda just uh, noted, and, and, and uh, many, I believe, you know, uh, perhaps all colleagues are, are, uh, are going to be co-sponsoring a financial incentive to try to attract uh, additional investment and opportunities, and specific, specifically in this uh, key uh, industry, and, and there's tremendous opportunity in some of those opportunity zones. Obviously, White Oak comes to mind for all of us, but uh, there are others uh, throughout the county uh, as well uh, where there's real uh, opportunity here, and I do think that we need to invest. Uh, in uh, those uh, communities and partner with the private sector to incentivize them uh, to, to, to invest uh, in, in those areas and those uh, communities. Uh, you know, I think that those financial incentives are the best uh, and would be the most effective uh, way for us to uh, drive investment uh, into those areas and then have a you know, macro level regulatory review process that is the same uh, for, uh, for, for everybody and then target uh, with additional incentives uh, in uh, areas where we think it would be uh, most beneficial uh, for these to locate, where we have other uh, priorities, uh, uh, important, critical priorities uh, for, for investment uh, to take place. And so, uh, you know, that is the, the general uh, approach that, uh, that, that, we had, uh, that we had taken. Uh, as noted, the, uh, the uh, incentive uh, which we were going to put forward today, uh, there was a, a note from uh, council staff and uh, MCEDC that there's a, a technical tweak that we need to address. And so we wanted to uh, address that before uh, uh, putting it forward, which, which we will be doing uh, in, in short order. And so that will be uh, moving forward as well. Uh, I just thought it might be helpful. Uh, we took a very aggressive approach uh, here. We had some uh, concern and resistance uh, and then ultimate consensus uh, from uh, planning staff and executive agencies on you know, what is actually doable uh, and, and, and what could be done. We, we reduced this process by 75%. Uh, percent. 
Uh, and so perhaps it would be helpful, uh, you know, Council Member Juwan noted, I think helpfully, uh, some other jurisdictions, neighboring jurisdictions that have uh, certain processes. So perhaps, uh, Mr. President, if it would be okay with you, if we could hear uh, briefly from uh, planning uh, and or uh, the executive agencies that would be uh, involved in this, uh, you know, what their, uh, you know, belief is of whether or not the 45-day window would be, uh, you know, doable uh, and, and, and able to be uh, uh, completed uh, in a, you know, within that time frame. So we'll do that. And then I've got Council Member Navarro and then Council Member Hucker in the queue next. Uh, so Chairman Anderson or Director Wright. Um, we had spoken during the um, work sessions on this that 60 days is very aggressive. Uh, I think the council needs to understand that whatever number of days we're talking about, it's actually 10 less because we do believe we still need to give appropriate public notice for any of our items. So 60 days is really 50 days. 45 days would really be 35 days for review, we definitely do not recommend decreasing the number of days for public notice, because we think that's really, really important. Um, we have very, again, I, I can't speak to what Frederick's process is, but we have constituents who are very concerned about traffic and about environmental concerns for every development that comes in. And we do require developments to provide us with very detailed traffic information and stormwater management information. And those kinds of technical reports take time to analyze. They are not simple. And so again, I want to just be very clear that the work that is done in development review is not intended to be nitpicking or second bites of the apple or sending things back and forth for um, not a good reason. But we, again, have made a commitment to our residents to really thoroughly look at some very, very technical issues, and we need time to do that. 60 days will be challenging, but we'll do our best. I think 45 days would be more than challenging. Uh, thank you for that. I've got Councilmember Navarro followed by Councilmember Hucker, then Vice Pre Council Vice President Glass, and then Councilmember Tawando again. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Council President Albornoz. Um, so, you know, I, I, I did want to just chime in quickly about how um, important, you know, the racial equity and social justice impact statements are. I mean, after all, I'm the one who authored the legislation and felt that this was critical. And they are meant to make sure that there could be flags that give the decision makers the ability to figure out how can we address these issues. Um, but, they, but it's also important to put them in context. And I think that, you know, here we are balancing a number of policy priorities. I mean, we are quick to criticize the planning department and, and staff in terms of uh, perhaps not having enough uh, public participation. Uh, yet, uh, we tend to then want to propose even our shorter window, which will then affect that notice and that input and participation. So it's, a, it's just a, such a delicate balance, and I appreciate that very much. Um, so to me, I think that making sure that we are not setting, a, you know, setting up a situation where it is so restrictive that then nothing moves forward, especially in areas like the East County with Rebo White Oak and things of that nature, which is top of mind uh, in terms of racial equity um, issues. I, I think that providing, you know, an incentive is another very tangible way to address some of those issues um, while pushing the envelope a bit. I mean, this is pushing the envelope, believe it or not, for us. And then perhaps reevaluating and seeing how it's going. But it is going to be difficult, I think, to balance all of this. And I just wouldn't want to set ourselves up for more barriers because we have such good intentions to, you know, 
push the limit even further. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make that comment, and and obviously this is you know the main reason why I I, I thought that working towards some kind of incentive incentive program, you know, grants, etc would be the best way. And I look forward to ironing out whatever wrinkles we have there because um, to me, you know, this this uh, again, this will spark a lot of interest uh, on folks who are people of color in this space, knowing that we are actually putting money on the table to make, you know, to, to invite them over. So um, so anyway, just wanted to, 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 to make that comment and, and, uh, and reflect on the, you know, fact that this is why I, I won't be able to support Councilmember Jawando's proposal, but it is because, you know, what we have heard from the folks that are going to have to administer this as well as making sure that the public still has that period of time that is necessary for notice. Um, I, I think that might work against our intended goals um, instead. Thank you. Thank you. And I, this is my fault. Uh, Councilmember Reamer was in the queue. Uh, Chairman Reamer was in the queue. So he is next, followed by Councilmember Hucker, then Council Vice President Glass. Thank you. I was just trying to say that maybe we can find a way here. You know, I, I, I am somewhat, you know, I, I think there's a principle and there's a practicality. And I think that I'm skeptical that applicants would say that it's so important to be at 45 days versus 60. I think what's crucial is being really certain and being fast. I think perhaps there's an allowance. You know, perhaps we can allow them to request 45 days. I hear what Ms. Wright is saying about, um, you know, especially the stormwater. I think, actually, I think it was my proposal. I don't think we subject these projects to transportation tests now uh, through the through the, the grip. I think we remove that requirement. Um, and so, you know, frankly, it's, you know, th that's an element that isn't part of this, uh, if I'm if I'm recalling correctly, and it could lend itself to. Uh, well, it does lend itself to a much more expedited review. Um, so I'm not sure I see the harm in allowing 45 days, but I understand that the entity that has to deal with that is really planning, and you know they have certain capabilities. And in order to line everything up to achieve a 45 day timeline, you know, they would have to do things even more differently than they're contemplating doing things now. Um, but I also think that this will not be common. You know, it hasn't been common enough. Um, you know, we'd like to see, we, we wish it were common, yeah. but we, we know that it's more unusual. Uh, with the exception of downtown Silver Spring, you know, where we have a biotech behemoth uh, that is maybe you could take advantage of some of this, um, you know, it, it won't be every day. So perhaps it's viable. Um, I mean, I guess Germantown, that, that, that um, opportunity zone is also benefiting substantially and, and there are projects there uh, with the, with Montgomery College campus. So to Chair Anderson, you know, can you find a practical solution here to- Yeah, I, 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 I understand. I, I can totally appreciate the desire to give an edge to these areas. I would suggest an alternative to the to compressing the time frame, which is already very tight under this bill, rather than trying to further tighten the time frame, which we are uh, we are really concerned that we cannot meet a tighter time frame. It's going to be hard enough at sixty days, as Gwen has said. However, if you want to give another edge to these projects, there's other ways to do that. For example, you could tell us to waive the fees for those opportunity zone projects for biohealth, that will have budget impact. You would have to backfill that. It wouldn't be, I don't think, an enormous amount of money. But if you're trying to give an additional incentive, it's possible to give a little bit of an economic incentive as opposed to telling us, you know, speed up the treadmill, right? That's another alternative I'd offer up And that's to like not inconsequential, right? Doesn't it cost a couple hundred thousand dollars to submit a sketch plan and so forth? It depends. Yes, it is a substantial amount of money. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars and for I a project that's could... 150,000 square feet or larger. It can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or you could have money well spent, I think, by the county, uh, you know, to, to, to offset that expense. I mean, it or if you decided that was too much, you could give them a 50% fee waiver. So I'm just saying there's ways to do this if you wanted to 
give a little bit of an edge to projects in certain areas without further squeezing us on the time frame, which is already going to be very challenging. So we just urge you to uh, find another incentive if you're looking for an additional one rather than uh, pushing us beyond the breaking point. I see Councilmember Fried sent his hand up, I assume, and it looks like about this specifically. Um, Councilmember Fried and Councilmember Jawando as well. Uh, Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, I appreciate this. So, I mean, the first question is whether or not we think financial incentives are the best approach to address uh, these issues uh, or, or not. That was precisely the uh, the, the, the uh, proposal that uh, Councilmember uh, Navarro and I uh, were putting forward. That was that thought process and that approach. And when we uh, put that forward, the thought was this wasn't uh, the only way we were going to need to uh, incentivize this. And so I think it's helpful uh, for, for planning. I prefer it if it weren't uh, now, if it was previous, but, uh, you know, to, to, to think through those ideas. I think the application fee, a discount on the application fee uh, is a very important proposal. I think it would be additive uh, to uh, the uh, grant uh, proposal that we uh, had, had, had uh, discussed. So I, I would you know, first, we can't do that through a zoning text amendment. That you know, it's not really, you know, directly relevant from a legislative procedure uh, to this. I, I don't believe we can set the uh, application fees here, but maybe uh, uh, the legislative attorney, maybe Ms. Madhu, can uh, can can clarify that. Um, and you know, perhaps it would be helpful for uh, for planning to come up with uh, some proposals for us of you know, what a standard application fee would be for projects like these. Uh, and what a full discount of 100%, a 25%, a 50%, a 75% discount, so we can understand uh, it uh, for a subsequent uh, introduction. I'd be interested in you know, putting that forward uh, at the appropriate time, uh, but maybe uh, the legislative attorney, uh, Ms. Nadu, could share with us whether the application fee question is something that would be uh, or could be included uh, in this uh, zoning text amendment. Yeah, I'll just note, I agree, because it's a technical question. We need a technical response, which is critically important. Um, I do want to be respectful of my colleagues who are in the queue, but I am going to ask Ms. Madhu to respond to the technical aspect of this conversation so we don't go too far down this rabbit hole. Are we permitted to adjust fees within a ZTA? No. Thank you. Um, so just from a, a legal perspective, it's a good idea, um, but would, would need to be done in a separate setting. Uh, Council Member Jawando. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate that answer. Um, I guess it would be need to be legislation, Ms. Nadu. Okay. Could you just say yes for the for the visually impaired? Yes. Okay. Um, and certainly we'll want to work on, you know, I think that's a, a good idea. Um, I guess to Mr. Anderson's point and Ms. Wright's point, uh, just on on this issue, the allowing, you know, we have 14 census tracts that are uh, in the county that are opportunity zones. So to Councilman Reamer's point, this is not a large swath of the county. And I think this would be a very innovative strategy. I'm not aware uh, of anyone who has used the land use in this way in a racial equity sense uh, to shortened timelines for racial equity purposes. So I actually think it's a it's an innovative approach. I initially a, a, a proposed 60 and 90 days to address planning's concerns about the uh, staff capacity. Um, but I do think in this sense, since Frederick's doing 45, DC does 49, and it's going to be a small group, and to Councilmember Reamer's point, we can waive there's certain things that aren't included in it. Maybe having an allow, allow the folks to request 45 as opposed to automatically doing it, that, that would seem to lessen what I already think would presumably be not a large burden already. So, but sensitive to the, to the, to the issue, but I think that's a, that's an elegant way of trying to address it. So I, when we get to the motion part, I'd be willing to amend that uh, in light of Mr. Reamer's point uh, to, to try to find some, uh, yet again, a, a third crack at consensus here. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Hucker, followed by Council Vice President Class. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know we, we've sort of, I think, morphed a little bit from the, the, the bill to the amendment. So, I, I just want to say on the front end, I'm grateful to Council Member Friedson, excited to see 
these opportunities focused, especially on uh, Down County and East County. I think Silver Spring in particular doesn't get enough attention. Uh, I rarely hear it discussed as a biohealth hub, but I really think it needs to be. It's of course been one of our uh, uh, very important businesses there have been doing, has been doing much of the heavy lifting in the global biohealth uh, arena for uh, quite a while. And East County has tremendous unrealized potential because it's one of the last remaining areas in Montgomery County with uh, relatively affordable land outside the Ag Reserve, which is off the table for this. Um, you know, businesses continue to tell us that unnecessary delays and time-consuming uh, processes are usually the reason that they uh, choose somewhere else to establish themselves and invest money and create jobs rather than Montgomery County. And so I'm glad we're having this discussion and we need many more to focus on that. Um, on the amendment, I really agree with everything Councilmember Navarro said about the balance between public input and expediting review and creating jobs. But I'm, I'm, uh, I feel a little bit challenged by the idea that like DC and Frederick County are doing things we aren't doing. And I think we should be asking ourselves why that is. So if planning needs more staff, I feel like we should talk about that. If they need a rebalancing of priorities to focus on expediting review that uh, uh, puts um, family providing living wage jobs in our in our opportunity zones, that's a great discussion to have. I'll show up early for that discussion. Um, I, uh, but we're in a historic economic recession. I would just want to see the council lean in on um, figuring out ways to knock down the barriers and make something like this happen rather than prolonging the pain and extending our competitive disadvantages relative to other um, other regions. And I do like Councilmember Reamer's suggestion about allowing them to request exceptions rather than putting all applicants under uh, the same timeline necessarily. I can't imagine there will be many of these, and I would love to have that problem uh, and come back to another discussion where we're talking about, geez, how do we uh, deal with all the applicants for biohealth uh, campuses in Montgomery County. That would be a fun discussion to have, uh, and we can we can adjust the budget accordingly. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, you know, at the onset, want to uh, extend my appreciation to Councilmember Friedson for for the legislation and proud to be an original co-sponsor. Uh, and I have to. Uh, associate myself with everything that Chair Reamer and Councilmember Hucker just said. Uh, you know, I, I understand the policy goal, particularly of the amendment, and I think it is absolutely laudable and has merit. Uh, but when the agency charged with doing this work is sharing with us that they don't think that they can do it under that timeline, then we have to figure out why that is. Uh, and I think that only highlights the need for additional reform. We're, we're talking about regional competitiveness. We're talking about Frederick. We're talking about D.C. We're talking about other areas. Uh, and I, I have concerns that if the only way we can deal with regional competitiveness is to continue giving money out to incentivize and make, make up for other shortcomings in our processes, well, let's change our processes. Let's reform our processes. Let's cut some red tape. Let's make the review times faster as we're talking about now. Uh, and that's what we need to do. I'd rather get to the root cause of these issues than continue to band-aid over them by giving more money out and cutting other uh, other um, impediments to people wanting to create these types of businesses here. Let's let's dig down into that conversation. This let's use this legislation and this conversation we're having right now as a vehicle to continue moving forward. So clearly, I support the. Uh, the legislation, and, and as it relates to the amendment, we'll see if Councilmember Juwando wants to further amend it. I, I, I support the goal, but not sure how workable it is if the agency is telling us it's not workable from their vantage point. So let's all work together to figure out what is workable to make sure that our review processes are faster, that we can do the things that we want to do, that we need to do for our own local economy. Um, and I'll I'll wait for the the further conversation about the particular amendment. So I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President Class. Because we are once again talking about technical and administration here. I am going to give uh, Director Wright the opportunity to comment, just you know, and elaborate on staff capacity and what it would take uh, to to expedite this moving forward. Seeing that there's consensus, and I'm, I know within the planning staff, uh, wanting to move things forward as quickly as possible too, but within reason, clearly. 
Um, so Director Wright, just your response to that, what would it take? And this is the broader conversation. We're about to commit our operating budget uh, soon. Um, well, just I think it's a broad conversation on many levels. Um, the council may or may not know that many of our development laws and regulations are much, much more um, tight and um, uh, have greater restrictions and requirements than some of our adjacent uh, counties. We have probably some of the strictest stormwater management laws and forest conservation laws and uh, other kinds of legislation in the entire state of Maryland. We um, continue to try to refine those laws and make them even better. And I think that there is um, a balance as we add more very, very important and laudable um, policies and laws uh, regarding many things, whether, and again, I don't wanna only focus on the environment. I wanna also really talk about, you know, restrictions and, and suggestions and laws and policies that we have about how to mitigate building height that is adjacent to uh, other communities, which is an issue in places like Silver Spring and um, Bethesda, where we're trying to get more biohealth things going, where we have restrictions and laws about how we handle what you can put underground in the public right of way versus what you have to put under your building. We have, we have just a slew of, again, very, very complex um, laws, policies, regulations that have been approved. So when we go through the development review process, it's both a technical review, but it is a review of all of these different types of goals that the council has set forward in the form of ZTAs and code changes. And a lot of times we have to think very creatively about how to both accomplish the goals of the applicant and meet the greater public goals that have been laid out for things like environment, for forest, for walkability, for stormwater management. You know, it, it, it's, it's for compatibility with adjacent communities. I mean, it's a very, very challenging uh, jigsaw puzzle, which I have to, to tell you may not be the same as some of the more green fields types of development that may be occurring in um, places like Frederick. So, um, you know, and we, you know, do take very seriously the idea that there has to be a balance between moving projects through quickly and efficiently while also remembering that our residents are also our constituents and they need to have pre-application meetings to understand what the project is that's coming into their community. They need to have notice. They need to be able to participate in our development review committee meetings. And we've been doing lots of uh, important things to increase that participation. Um, it is a true balance. Um, and we just have to say, even if we had a lot more staff, um, I, I don't know that we would be able to get to that balance in 45 days. What might happen is that we would review projects that would be heavily conditioned. That is, we would say it's approved, but you have to work out your stormwater management with DPS after the board approval. You have to work out your access permit with SHA after the planning board approval. And so there would be a great deal of additional time at the far end after the board because we would have to take some of the more thorny, difficult issues and push it off. 
So um, I don't know if others on our team have anything they want to say. I also know that Victor Salazar from Department of Permitting Services is here. We have had meetings with Department of Permitting Services to talk about how to make the 60 days work. Um, but I, I'm guessing, although I don't want to speak for Victor, that they would also be somewhat challenged with the 45 days. Let's hear from Victor then. Um, I know Councilmember Katz has requested to be in the queue broadly, um, and then I'm going to go back to Councilmember Jawando to make his specific motion again. Um, Mr. Salazar, please go ahead. I'm just going to echo everything that uh, uh, the sentiments of Gwen. Um, it will be a challenge for DPS, and we are having uh, discussions, as she alluded to, um, uh, talking about the technical aspects of how we were going to accomplish this. Um, but, uh, you know, we are supportive of um, this endeavor, um, and, but we are just, uh, you know, just trying to figure out um, how we're going to make it happen. So whatever you guys decide, uh, we will just put our heads together and try to figure it out. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Councilmember Katz, and then I'll go back to Councilmember Jawando regarding his motion. Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I believe... And, and so much has already been said about what I was going to say, but I, I believe that the, um, that the public discussions are extremely important. It, it certainly, uh, we need to keep them involved. We, and, and we should and will keep them involved. Uh, stormwater management, those discussions are important. Uh, transportation issues are important. The, the, the fact that we are, uh, with this legislation as it exists, to uh, to, to Councilmember Friedson's point, to be seventy five percent better, that's a tremendous. That's, what you guys that's a do. tremendous step. That's my right. and, and and then um, uh, to for us to then say, but you know, you could say fifteen days. I don't know how many uh, places that are going, uh, looking to build one hundred and fifty thousand square feet or 50,000 as an addition, that 15 days is going to make that much of a difference to them in, when they're dealing in those types of those types of issues. I think we should figure out what we can do with the 60 days. I think that we're going to have challenges to do that, but we need to figure out with those challenges how we can do it. If we can, if we can get there and we find that there is need for additional time uh, or less time, then that's something to consider. But the other thing that we have to do is we have to look at our competition, as we've said time and time again. And if their competition, as much as we don't like financial incentives, if that's what they're given, then we need to do better. We need to do better than they are. If there's a competition on the waiving of fees, then let's consider that. But that is a broader discussion than today's. I believe that we cannot do, we cannot bite off more than we can chew. And I think it's going to be very tough on us to, to have the 60 days. And it is, it is imperative that our public remain involved. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando. I yield back to you to uh, um, uh, amend or make your motion, and then we'll uh, see if there's a second. We'll have a formal discussion on the amendment itself. Uh, Councilmember Jawando. Got it. I appreciate that. Um, again, I just, wanted the first compromise was 60 90. I think the principle is really, really important here. I think in everything we do, we have to address the, the racial equity and disparities, particularly in an industry like this. And I think it's an innovative way to use it with the approval or regulatory approval process. Again, I'm supportive of the underlying bill. We all are. Um, uh, but this is an important detail and, you know, in, in component of it. And so whether I, have, I had initially proposed 90, which would have taken it down from 120, which it is today, to 90, to recognize planning's concerns, and then 60 in opportunity zones, if we did, you could do any, um, you know, co combination. You could do 75, take it down from 120, and do 60 in opportunity zones. I just think the principle of having it targeted in opportunity zones is important. You could do what Councilmember Reamer proposed, which I'm going to I think officially move uh, to get us down to Frederick in DC and do 45 in opportunity zones um, and 60 uh, in across the across the, the the board. And I understand planning's concerns, 
Um, that's a larger issue that we need to address. And if there does do need to be more staff and resources, or if we need to adjust the process further, we should. Um, but I, I think, again, these are 14 census tracts. I hope White Oak in Germantown, and I hope we get a ton of these requests. And that, again, good, that would be a good problem to have. Um, I guess one of the questions I was going to ask is how many of these do we have pending right now before I make my, my motion? This is the planning. Well, I can tell you we've had quite a few um, biotech projects of late. And opportunities. Uh, and and that, opportunities. Uh, we had provided this information. We did a quick check of the uh, you know, last year or so. We've probably had seven or eight. And in opportunity zones, Ms. Wright, on an in opportunity zones, days. in opportunity zones, you've had seven or eight or countywide. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear council member Jawando if you had another question. Can you, can you hear me now? Can you all hear me? Yeah, I was saying, is it seven or eight in opportunity zones or countywide? Um, I would have to go back and look at that number. They definitely are in um, Great Seneca Science Corridor in Silver Spring, which I believe Silver Spring is an opportunity zone, if I'm not mistaken. I, I would need to go back and look at the okay. map. I can't well, tell you that are, some, some are, some aren't probably, you know, okay. All right, well, I'd like to, to again, I think it's the, it's really important to, to do this in, in principle here and in practice. And to Councilmember Katz's point, uh, you know, 15 days, every every development I talk to, it's if you don't do it tomorrow, it's costing money. So, so I think I think that, uh, and again, no harm if they don't come in and request it, then the staff capacity issue is not an issue. I just think like it's either it can't be both all things. So it's got to be one or the other. It's either got to be a problem, or it's not, or it's going to be a good problem to have. But we have to enshrine this principle, I think, in in everything we do. So, so I'd like to adjust my initial motion to be a uh, opt in. Uh, we've used that term a lot, and Miss Miss Nadu, I think, has the language here. Uh, it would say, if located in an opportunity zone, applicant may request the planning board schedule a hearing within 45 days. So that would be the actual language, um, and I would move that officially. Second. Second. Is uh, moved by Councilmember Wando, Jawando, seconded by Councilmember Reamer. Um, and uh, we're going to open up discussion. I do have something to say about this. Um, was there anybody in the queue for the discussion? Okay, uh, let me just say a couple of things. I certainly understand and respect the intent of Councilmember Jawando. I um, really appreciate that. But I think we really need to dig down in, into what Director Wright said here. Um, it's not more staff uh, alone uh, that's going to get us to be able to expedite. Um, with the best of intentions, this and previous councils have added uh, a number of benchmarks that addressing climate issues, addressing stormwater management issues, we have been intentional about so that we are cautious uh, in our approach. And it's those layers that I know speaking for myself, I often hear about from our, uh, our community, our business and our development community um, are, are the reason why it takes as long as it does. And I know a thing or two about unfunded mandates as uh, uh, being in the executive branch for 12 years. And I know it just ends up frustrating everybody around you because you are put in a position to fail and you set expectations that can't be met by the staff. It then reflects poorly on the staff. It reflects poorly on the county even further. And we already have our foot down on the gas in a way that is really unprecedented down to the 60 days. And so I take very much to heart the concerns that have been raised by the agency who's going to be the most responsible for actually carrying this out in telling us that we need to have a broader conversation about all of these issues as was noted by many of my colleagues, but we don't wanna put our staff in a position to fail. I understand the symbolism, but I think there are other ways as have been noted that we can address this in a way that actually will be more effective um, I want to follow up and see how we can eliminate the fees for opportunity zones. If that can't be done through a ZTA, then it should be done legislatively as another incentive. I appreciate the efforts of Councilmember Fritzen and, and Councilmember Navarro and the Fed Committee who unanimously has supported another approach to addressing this issue. 
but symbolism is important, no question about it. And addressing the underlying issues of racial equity is, there's nothing more important. I just don't think this solution, because it would be symbolic if staff can't comply, um, is, is actually going to help. I think it may end up creating more problems than we're trying to solve. So I, I don't support this amendment for those reasons, but I certainly understand and respect the direction it's coming from and will gladly uh, support legislation that looks at things like eliminating fees within those opportunity zones. But I just feel on the whole, and when you take all of this together, that's where I come down. And I do suggest Chairman Reamer, that we have a follow-up conversation with planning staff on this broader issue of looking at those areas and how we can expedite even further, which I know the committee has done a great job um, for, for a number of years uh, in working to address. So those are my thoughts and reflections and where I come down on this for now. Um, uh, Council Member Friedson followed by Council Member Jawando. Oh, no, thank I, I, if I could be in the queue after we discarded the amendment. Uh, okay. For the roll call vote, but uh, I've shared my views on this. Appreciate uh, the, the rationale behind it. I think there are other ways uh, to address it. I am concerned about setting unrealistic expectations and then setting ourselves up for failure. I think that could do more harm than good on our efforts uh, to, to really focus on uh, areas that have lacked investment. I think there are other ways uh, and mechanisms to do it. And we proposed one. There are many more, one of which was discussed today, and I look forward uh, to those uh, conversations. Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say, I just want to make sure to your comments, Council President, it's, it's not symbolic. I think it's an effort to be very substantive and, and meaningful. And again, if, if 60 is the magic number, again, the original amendment was to try to recognize it in a 60 90. We could do, we could move the days, but to say that, you know, I'm just, it's, it's unreasonable because that specific number won't work. The principle is important and it should, and I think this is a way to address it. Again, I'm, I was very open to, to adjusting the numbers. There was not a willingness to do that. Um, if, if planning staff cannot make 60 happen uh, for every opportunity zone or which they're going to have to, or if they can't make, you know, to, to go to 90 or 75, I just think it's important to enshrine it as a, as a practicality and as a principle. Um, but uh, just wanted to address that and appreciate appreciate the opportunity to come back. No, I, and I appreciate the clarification. Um, and you said symbolism. That's why I said symbolism. But but it, it is more than that. Uh, and so you're absolutely right about that. And and I agree um, that it it needs to be uh, so much more. And 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 I appreciate again the intent from which this motion was made. Um, but I just go back to we heard very clearly. 60 is going to be tough as it is. 45 even worse. And I'll note one last thing. I, on the behalf of my colleagues, just recently sent a memo to our colleagues in the Park and Planning Commission regarding concerns that had been raised in a previous conversation about transparency and about access. Uh, and, and we can't, I, it's important to put them in the best position to succeed, acknowledging as they have, and all of us have, the, the importance of transparency in these projects. Uh, and people don't always agree with them. And we need to give them the appropriate lane to provide those comments and feedback. So uh, we've discussed this a lot. I thank you all very much. There is a motion on the floor that just has been seconded by Council Member Reamer. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. That is Council Members Glass, Hucker, Jawando, and Reamer in favor. All those opposed? That is Council Member Katz, Friedson, and Navarro. Uh, Council Member Rice, are you? able to yes mr president um i'm actually in uh the post at this point i actually wanted to say something beforehand that's why my hand is raised but that's okay i apologize i didn't see that's that right. that note uh thank that's you. all right so council member rice uh is opposed to the motion as well the motion fails um three to six four to six four to five excuse me four to five <laughs> um council member friedson if uh I just want to yield to Council Member Rice if he still wanted to say say something, Mr. President, if that was appropriate. Well, thank you, Council Member Friedson, and thank you, uh, Council President. Look, um, from my perspective, there's still a lot of questions, and I agree with Council Member Tawando in principle in terms of what it is he needs to do. There's no question about prioritizing, uh, prioritizing these areas. 
uh, that are opportunity zones. I do just want to remind folks that even those areas that aren't opportunity zones still need to be prioritized. Biohealth is something that we're doing a lot of work in trying to make sure that uh, is diversified. And a lot of our work that's happening with Montgomery College in terms of building that workforce are things that we are trying to do. So it's not just about the location of that area that will benefit those residents who we're trying to target. And so from that standpoint, I think that again, um, while there are incentivizations that are necessary, I think that working with us from a financial perspective, as well as working with some of the other things that we know are gonna continue to benefit our community as a whole is where we wanna go. So from that standpoint, because there are still questions about whether or not something like this could be done, is the only reason why I did not support uh, moving forward to the uh, stag to, to the reduced time frame. I do think, however, that we need to move forward as quickly as possible uh, with uh, the incentivization uh, procedures so that we can ensure uh, that some of these things move quickly. So from that standpoint, I just wanted to be on record in terms of where I stand there and look forward to following the lead of Councilmember Juando and others who are focused on making sure that we can uh, give priority to these opportunity zones throughout the town. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Reedson. And uh, colleagues, thank you. Yeah, uh, just yeah. a quick time check because obviously we're close to 1230 yeah. here. Um, the next item won't take as long, that's my understanding. Uh, and then uh, the consent calendar uh, should should be fairly quick. We are gonna start our brown bag lunch at 1245 um, rather than 1230 uh, so that we can accommodate. But Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, thank you. The next item is really a technical uh, uh, part of, of, of this uh, in SRA uh, related. So I very much hope that it uh, won't take uh, very long to uh, approve as well. But we had a really good conversation today. I just didn't want to lose sight of the uh, consensus because there is consensus here on this council. Everybody has been in support uh, of this uh, effort. There were a few details that we were working out. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, we want Montgomery County to be the best place in the world to start invest and grow life-saving and life-altering businesses. And our biohealth innovation uh, industry uh, is at the cutting edge. I mean, you think about uh, places like American uh, Gene Technologies, which is poised to cure AIDS and HIV and, and have uh, a, an operating system that changes the way that medicine uh, and, 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 uh, and treatments uh, happen uh, for, for all kinds of diseases. You think about places like United Therapeutics, as Councilmember Hucker uh, noted before, that is developing personalized lungs from pigs for transplants, that is doing the most important transplant research uh, and innovation anywhere in the world. There are uh, USA Today and New York Times and international newspapers that are covering the research and innovation that are happening here. Uh, you think about Novavax and what they're doing uh, with uh, the vaccine uh, for this uh, you know, particular uh, pandemic that we're in now. And I am sure that the next pandemic through the Global Pandemic Center that we all have worked on with the executive branch, uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna be addressing it here in Montgomery County forever uh, for the future. And so this is part of that effort. This isn't the beginning uh, of our conversation. The reason why we have a great biohealth uh, industry is because of decisions that were made before. Uh, but if we rest on our laurels, that won't continue. And so this is about being intentional doubling down on these efforts. And I just really wanna thank colleagues again for the overwhelming support that we're doing here, the many efforts that we have undertaken to, 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 to grow uh, this uh, industry uh, and, and also to, to council staff, to planning staff, uh, to uh, all of the executive agencies. This really has been uh, an all hands on deck uh, collaborative effort. It's complicated, uh, but uh, it is critical. And um, it is going to be uh, really important so that these organizations who have choices of where they locate uh, can focus on the research and innovation and technology and not on the uh, more than needed, more than absolutely necessary regulatory uh, environment and, and, and red tape. So I uh, really appreciate it. I think this is going to be a watershed moment for our biohealth industry. And I'm really proud uh, of the work of this council and our partnership with uh, planning, the executive branch and so many other stakeholders. Uh, so I look forward to, uh, to the roll call vote, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilman Fritzen. Ms. Nadu, was there anything else uh, in the packet on this before we go to the roll call? No, there was not, Council President. Great. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Fritzen? Yes. Mr. Fritzen votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. 
Mr. Jawanda votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. And Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. Uh, let the record show that that passed unanimously. Uh, we now move on to item B, which is a technical issue. Uh, this is a subdivision regulation amendment to SRA 2102, Administrative Subdivision, BioHealth Priority Campus. Uh, Chairman Raymer, I'll turn to you uh, and then Ms. Nadu to frame this quickly. This is just to implement what we just approved. Uh, so doesn't need, the, Ms. Nadu, I'll let you do any explaining that must be done. Uh, but it is written to be consistent with what we've just adopted in the zoning text amendment. So what this SRA does, um, so BioHealth Priority Campus may want to take advantage of the subdivision process now that the regulatory approval process has been shortened by ZTA 2109. What this will do is it'll make a BioHealth Priority Campus go through the administrative subdivision process rather than the preliminary plan process. Um, it's 90 day review instead of 120 days. So the two procedures can run parallel. Uh, I don't see any discussion here. Uh, so uh, this is also a roll call vote. So if we could please call the, oh, Councilman Friedson, you wanna say something? Yeah. I was oh, okay, got it. Roll okay. call vote, I'm <laughs> okay. trying to speed okay. things along. Madam Follow Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Jawando? Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. Uh, let the record show that passed unanimously as well. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Uh, this this is exciting, uh, and, and I know uh, Councilmember Friedson will be making more formal announcements about this tomorrow or a public meeting, and uh, we'll hear more about that soon. Uh, but this this is um, important to move forward. Uh, we now move on to our last two items before our um, lunch recess, and the first is an action item. This is item number four, and the appointment to the Board of Appeals. Uh, to Mr. Roberto Pinero. Uh, we had some outstanding candidates as we normally do this time around. Uh, and we were just so impressed and so appreciative of Mr. Pinero's willingness to step forward. Uh, I know that we'd like to, uh, I'm gonna defer to my colleague, Councilmember Navarro to make this motion. I'm honored to dominate Mr. Roberto Pinero as a member of the Montgomery County, Maryland Board of Appeals. Mr. Pinero brings a wealth of professional experience related to housing policy to this appointment. But he has also dedicated his life to serving our most diverse communities throughout the county on a volunteer basis. He has served as chairman of the Interagency Commission on Homelessness, Montgomery County, housing commissioner and previous chairman of HOC, member of the board of directors of the town center apartments of Rockville, a senior low income development, NCPS commission, and also the commission on children and youth among others. I have no doubt, given his wealth of experience, that he will be a great asset to the Board of Appeals. So it is my honor to um, nominate Mr. Pinero. Thank you. I see a second from Councilmember Hucker. Confirming Councilmember Hucker? Yes. Uh, terrific. All those in favor of uh, at this appointment, please raise your hands. And that is unanimous. Congratulations, Mr. Pinero. Thank you so much for your service. We look forward to your service on the Board of Appeals. And that takes us to the last item before recess, and that is the consent calendar. Can I get a motion to accept the consent calendar? So moved. moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Rice. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the consent calendar, please raise your hands. And that is also unanimous. Um, thank you all so much, colleagues. Uh, we will now adjourn uh, and reconvene at 1245 for our brown bag lunch. And I believe IT staff, please confirm it's the same link that we're on right now. Is that correct? That is correct. 
Great. So uh, just if you want to turn off your cameras and your mics and come back, we'll just come back to the same link. We'll see you in 15 minutes. Just to help my parents pay for groceries or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways